you know, this is a, a uh, an incredible day and week that where we really get to celebrate our graduates. This year, more than any other, um, we're really so thrilled to be able to do this in person to celebrate the six graduates and their journey through uh, New York Orthopedic Hospital, Columbia Orthopedics. Uh, and we couldn't think of a better person to have as our visiting professor than Roy Sanders uh, to uh, be here with us. He was last here as a visiting professor in 2002. Uh, so he's one of the few people who've actually been here twice uh, for graduation. At Roy, as you know, our graduates get to select their visiting professor. And we, that's a tradition that we've instituted that I think is, makes this an even more special event. Um, and uh, we'll have lots of time to celebrate the six of you throughout the day, but um, let me just start by saying that uh, we're so proud of everything that you guys have accomplished uh, in your five years here. Uh, and you've set a very high standard uh, for how to work together, how to set the standard, how to be mentors and teachers for the junior residents uh, and how to uh, really be leaders and role models. And, and it's been a uh, pleasure to see all of you and we'll look forward to tonight's roast slash toasts uh, where we'll get to share some other details about the six of you. Dr. Durska says he's gonna be on his best behavior. <laughs> right, Dr. Durska? Sure. <laughs> uh, Paul Park, I don't know, it's gonna be crazy. Anyway, um, so uh, my disclosure it has no Im impact on this introduction. Um, so Dr. Sanders, Dr. Sanders uh, started, uh, he's a New York boy. Uh, he started at City University in 1975, went to NYU uh, in 1980, uh, did Beth Israel's internship in 1981 and did the hospital for joint disease residency for the residents you don't know that they were separate back then. There was NYU and there was joint disease and then they subsequently merged. He did a trauma fellowship, as he just mentioned, with Mark Swankowski, who's the editor-in-chief for JBJS. Uh, and then he did a couple of different fellowships, tra traveling type with some of the um, original leaders in AO, and then did some time in uh, Seattle at Dr. Greisberg's uh, alma mater with uh, Sig Hansen. Uh, when you think about leadership, uh, Roy is at the top of the leadership chain. Uh, he has been the professor and chair at University of South Florida, where he's been in Tampa for uh, 30 years and been chair since 2015. He started the Florida Orthopedic Institute and has been the uh, chair of that board since 1995. He's the past president of the OTA. And I, I'm pretty sure he's the longest standing tenured editor in chief of any journal because he's been doing it since 1996. Oh my God. That is unbelievable. Um, Scholarly productivity, uh, 155 peer-reviewed publications, 27 book chapters, eight books and monographs. He has 39 patents, uh, as you heard earlier. So he's an innovator. He thinks about problems and solves them. He's been a course chair for over 50 programs and he's given over 250 international and national presentations. So obviously he's a, uh, a incredible leader and educator. He's been mentoring and teaching residents and fellows for three decades since something he's very proud of. Uh, last night, he got to spend some time with our graduates to see if they could top the Jill Walsh bill from five years ago. And I haven't seen the final tally yet, but I'm, I suspect it's, it's close. <laughs> Uh, so Roy's going to share two talks today. The first is going to be observations and innovation and then treatment of injuries to the tailless after our graduates presentations. Roy, thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, New York has uh, changed tremendously since I was here. Uh, every time I come back, it looks different. Uh, and uh, at least now we're all post COVID. So that's really wonderful. And it's great, you know, almost nobody's wearing masks here and uh, everybody is uh, vaccinated. And uh, I just, um, I hope it uh, keeps going that way uh, because uh, it's, um, it's really, uh, I just wanna get back to normal like everybody else does. So I'm gonna uh, talk to you today about uh, something that um, uh, is pretty interesting to me. Uh, we keep talking and we even in the, in the cases we showed today about, uh, you know, uh, what was possible then, what is possible now. So I just wanted maybe, I think certainly the residents don't understand all this stuff. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, 
uh, the progress of uh, orthopedic trauma surgery. And this, this makes sense across all, all the spectrums in orthopedics. And these are uh, some of my uh, disclosures, uh, which I have to give um, required to do that. But uh, uh, this guy is my mentor uh, and Howard Rosen, he's no longer here. He brought AO to America in uh, 66. Uh, and uh, he uh, is the reason that I'm a, a traumatologist, a tremendous individual with joint diseases uh, and uh, really trained a tremendous number of folks. Uh, so here you see a uh, typical IM nail. Uh, and uh, I want you to look at it and uh, we'll just look at this room for a minute, right? You, you kind of see this uh, and uh, you see this uh, technique here, you know, percutaneous and uh, nail is in. Uh, and uh, is there anything remarkable about this case that you saw? And I'm gonna go through it again. Just think about it, right? You look at this room and, uh, you know, fracture table and fluoro and all of this and uh, this technique. And uh, for the residents, uh, most people, uh, they take it for granted. But if you think about it, um, you have anesthesia, you have a fracture table, you got a sterile field, reamers, titanium alloy implants and a percutaneous uh, technique. And uh, you take all this for granted now. You take it all for granted. Right? This is the way you do a nailing. But uh, how did we get here? Uh, and this is really the question. Uh, we create our science fiction because we can only imagine what we cannot accomplish, right? So that's when you think about it, you know, Dick Tracy watch or, you know, iPhones or going to Mars or whatever Elon Musk is trying to do this week. Uh, all that stuff is we're limited by our technology. And uh, if you really think about it, if you can dream it like Leonardo who did this uh, in the medieval times, right? He came up with uh, gliders and helicopters maybe, but in reality, he didn't have the technology to be able to do this. And if you look at this now, all of this stuff is possible, right? It just required technology. So uh, Arthur Clarke uh, said in 1993, if we've learned one thing from the history of invention, right? The most daring prophecies are probably laughably uh, conservative. And there are really a uh, uh, few ideas that are truly original uh, but most are clearly derivative, but that, that's not a bad thing because you have to move the bar, right? Uh, and uh, honestly, trial and error is really good. And that's what you'll understand uh, as you do your surgery and you practice and you get better and better what you're doing, you, you learn from your mistakes. And there's this great book that Mark Frankel actually gave me uh, called Being Wrong and it's Adventures in the Margin of Error, right? You don't learn right, from getting things right. You learn from making thing, making mistakes, right? You, you know, you try to drive somewhere and your GPS doesn't work. You're never gonna make that mistake again, right? You cut an artery or a nerve, you're never gonna make that mistake again. So you learn uh, from your mistakes. So what was, the, uh, what was the state of the art in the beginning of the 20th century? Well, this guy started uh, in 1886. This is the first uh, known set of uh, screws and fixation uh, in orthopedics. So that wasn't really that long ago. This guy Lambot, I uh, was a Belgian uh, general surgeon. Uh, he's a master surgeon. This is his lathe and his, he made all these instruments. He drew all this stuff, just a master. And um, he actually uh, wrote this book uh, on the intervention of fractures in 1907. So it's a little over hundred years ago, right? And he actually coined the term osteosynthesis. And this is, these are from his book. So this is hundred years ago. He's got clamps and fixation and plates and screws, right? Just the way we do it now. It's not that much different, right? Uh, obviously there's a lot of differences, but uh, he had the ideas back then and he actually could do this, not that frequently, but he could. But he was limited by anesthesia, he was limited by sepsis, he was limited by metallurgy, right? So if you think about it back then, they were using ether masks, right? They drip ether onto the cotton on, and they'd hold it until a patient passed out. Uh, and um, this, is a, this is the first uh, respirator in 1890, right? This is when you think about what we do now, right? And infection and sepsis, hand washing wasn't uh, discovered until 1860. Uh, by Semmelweis, and uh, you would think this guy would get the Mo Nobel Prize, but the people were so jealous of him 
uh, that actually uh, they told him he was crazy uh, and uh, they ended up putting him into an asylum. He got beaten to death. Actually, he got beaten to the point that he got an open fracture and then he died of sepsis in the asylum. So, uh, but uh, <clears throat> uh, you can see that Pasteur paid attention to it, came up with a germ theory and Lister came up uh, with all this stuff uh, and uh, came up with phenol. And phenol has been uh, very uh, good for a long time. And if you uh, ever uh, take any Listerine, you'll see this phenol in it. It's still in there and it's called Listerine because of Lister. So this is the first uh, a way to stop infection. Uh, and in terms of plates, this guy, uh, Lane, came up with a Lane plate in 1893. So plates are really old. Uh, and this was the start of internal fixation. But if you look at these plates, they always broke. Uh, they weren't really well made uh, and they're very hard to put them in. And they also had corrosion. So this, they, they were using the wrong metal. Okay, and this guy Sherman uh, invented a vanadium steel. And so this is an alloy. And this alloy is the reason that you can uh, put metal into patients and not have it corrode. Uh, and uh, he also came up with a plate called uh, the Sherman plate, 1914. This is his patent. Uh, and uh, if you look at it, uh, this is the way the plate looks. And uh, if you look at the Halmedica of pl pelvic plates that Mata des designed and described, it's really just a Sherman plate. So a hundred years go by and nothing has changed, right? But if people forget, then you, know, you can take credit for it. <clears throat> so uh, the war came uh, and uh, this is the first, I love, I love this picture because the donkey has a gas mask on as well. It's a terrible situation. But uh, the, how did they treat people with fractures, right? They had wards. So this was the humerus ward, right? So if you look at all these people, they were treated non-operatively because you couldn't, you know, sepsis was a big problem, right? So if you look at them, this is hanging traction, right? You see this, the weight, and they, they lived in, in buildings and, you know, I don't know, they spent three months there till their fractures healed, right? It worked, it's just kind of hard to accomplish, but uh, uh, th that's, that was the state of the art in World War I. And between the wars, uh, they just came up with these uh, plates that kind of held fractures together, but they were splinting fragments because they didn't understand that they needed to compress them because nobody uh, read Lambot's book, right? Which was in 1907. So uh, once uh, they had these significant improvements after the war in terms of anesthesia, sepsis, and metallurgy, this guy, Danis, uh, who was trained by Lambot, came up with another book and started uh, this uh, science, right? And he came up with this thing called a coaptor. And a coaptor is a plate that you can get compression. And if you look at this, the idea is you lock it distally, uh, and then uh, you apply uh, this screw loosely. Uh, they have this turnbuckle to tighten it, and at the end, you put in a lag screw, okay? Uh, but this was very, very hard to do, uh, and his results were not reproducible. So this, this was a, a, a real problem. Uh, but actually, compression was not a new concept because this guy, right, Albert Key, uh, started uh, using this uh, for arthrodesis and tuberculosis of the knee joint. So people were using compression, but again, things didn't come across the channel, right? Uh, so between Europe and America, uh, people didn't really uh, understand what was going on, but they were very effective in using compression to get an arthrodesis. Uh, and this paper um, by Roger Anderson, I don't know if any of you uh, know who he is, but he was up in Seattle. This paper was so remarkable, it had no bibliography because this was truly an original idea. This guy really invented this, right? Uh, and he came up with a new fracture therapy, which was double skeletal fixation, which is a closed procedure and the way he did this was this thing called a mechanical man. And when I got to tell you, when I was a resident and an intern at Bellevue, this is how we did uh, uh, pins and plaster, right? You'd put this thing on a tibia in this case, right? It was a forearm and you put it on, you put the pins in and you reduce it anatomically and you take a, a Polaroid x-ray, right? And then you could look at it 
because uh, they didn't have fluorine, and you wrap the plaster and then you cut the pins and you take it off, right? Pretty good. Looks like uh, Elizaroth to me, right? So nothing new, right? Nothing new. These guys, these, this is uh, Maurice Mueller, Al Gower, and Villeneger came up with this book in 59. They came up with all of this. And uh, this was uh, just a better mousetrap. This is the original coaptor, right? Made better. And uh, then uh, they actually uh, used this uh, round hole plate with an articulating tension device. And this is early AO technique where you get the compression and then you add uh, the plate, right? And the screws. And this guy who worked for them, uh, Stefan Perrin, came up with a dynamic compression plate that anybody who trained in the 90s, 80s, 90s, 2000s was uh, aware of this. This was before locking plates. Uh, and uh, this just used a slide inside so you didn't need the articulating tension device. And you could get uh, four millimeters of compression on a plate so you didn't need the articulating tension device. And this was a revolution in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but actually, uh, this was designed by an American named Colliston in 1950. Uh, and it was published in JBJS by this guy named Bagby, right? Uh, and if you look at this very carefully, it's the same plate. And Perrin copied this. They absolutely copied it because few ideas are original, right? So the question really uh, is why this plate did not catch on. This American guy in the 50s who published in JBJS, why, why did this not catch on? And the reason is because Maurice Mueller was an organizational genius. This guy really changed the way we taught orthopedics and actually a lot of the surgical sciences, right? He, uh, when he started, he fixed ankles. He was able to get uh, the uh, Swiss insurance companies to pay him to fix ankles because he proved to them uh, that he could get these people back to work within a year. Okay, and so he started getting money. He designed all these plates. He hired an, uh, a manufacturing company that worked for him. Uh, and then he started educating and he started teaching courses. So he was completely vertically integrated. When they came up with a design, they could go ahead and make it, they could sell it and they, they could keep it going. So this is, this in America, this wouldn't happen anymore because they would have said, uh, that it was a monopoly, uh, but he was able to do this. He had his own engineers, research, manufacturing, and sales, and he allowed him to take a product, produce it, and sell it. And this is uh, the first AO training course. And the genius of this was that you could not get the set of instruments unless you took the course, right? So you had to go to Davos, you had to, you know, kiss the ring, and then he gave you, you know, your instrument set, and then you were completely addicted to the AO. It's very good, uh, which is why Synthes owns 55% of the uh, fracture market in the world, right? Uh, and this was truly an innovative technique. But the problem with compression plating uh, is that uh, this is Rue's law, right? If you have a persistent pressure on bone, right, you can actually get resorption. And so you can end up with something like this. So they decided... Uh, back then to try to stop this. And they came up with this system in 1985, which was a lock plate for uh, ENT fixation, right? Uh, and then they added this to the spine, which was in 1985 called an internal fixator. And, and you see, this is a double system of locking. Uh, and then they came up for, uh, for fractures of the femur with the shuli, which was a nut underneath the plate, which worked very well. This is kind of when I started, which was the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and then in the 90s, uh, late 90s, they came up with the list plate, which was the first lock plate, right? And this is a percutaneous fixed angle lock plate. And here you see the, um, the patent for this, the Weaver patent, which nobody could get around. Uh, and they had a monopoly on lock plating. But actually, if you look at it, this is a paper that's published in JOT by one of my uh, ex fellows, uh, where they actually put screws, they created this, but they didn't have a patent on it. Uh, and these are the first uh, techniques. Uh, and the first techniques use unicortical screws because you could decrease your inventory with them. Uh, but the problem with it is uh, that uh, you ended up uh, with uh, too much motion uh, and uh, it ended up, I don't think uh, you can see here, there's just too much motion on this. So they came up with hybrid fixation. 
Uh, and this is the way we fix all these plates now, uh, these fractures now with plates. Uh, you uh, put in your uh, screws uh, and you get compression through these uh, uh, DCS holes, uh, and then you can uh, lock it with a locking screw and then use cortical screws, uh, unicortical screws uh, on the sides. Uh, so this is 100 years after Lombard. We've finally gotten to the point uh, where we can get reproducible results with fracture care using plates, right? Uh, and uh, what's interesting about this is that um, Everybody tried to get around the uh, patents and they couldn't. Uh, but during the war, there was a German guy named Reinhold who came up with locking plates and published it and uh, got patents in Europe in 1935 for this. And you can see he's even got threaded drill guys and everything. So they must have found this and just copied it. But who cares? It, it solved the problem now. So we went uh, from years of straight plates uh, and uh, to match uh, the shape of the bone, we had to bend them. Uh, and then we eventually went to uh, anatomic plates. Uh, I was able uh, to create this plate uh, in the uh, late 80s. Uh, but if you look at it, uh, it really wasn't very new, right? This is a Jude plate. Uh, and this is uh, my plate is just a variation on a theme. Uh, but we couldn't get this plate in America, which is why I designed that plate with the synthes. Uh, and they allowed us uh, uh, to uh, develop this plate. And it really is not that much different. The problem with it is it failed. Uh, and because it failed in about 8% of the cases, I came up with a different design, which is a perimeter plate, which I think is something, was something new at the time. Uh, and uh, what you uh, can see now is a lot of people have copied this, but uh, now we've gone to uh, percutaneous fixation and calcaneal fracture. So the plate designs are uh, completely different, right? So let's let's shift gears for a minute. This is the way we treat femur fractures in 1910, okay? Uh, and this was with uh, the Thomas splint. Uh, and uh, it wasn't until 1937 that Kuncher designed nails. And this is the first nail. He took a piece of metal and he bent it. That's it. That's the nail. Uh, and the second generation nail uh, was uh, the cloverleaf plate. Sorry, the cloverleaf nail. And if you look at this, right, uh, this is what was going on in World War II. All the, all the fighter pilots would uh, crash their planes, but they wouldn't die. They'd have femur fractures. Uh, and uh, both the American prisoners of wars and the Germans would get these nails and the German Air Force guys could go back and fly almost right away with the nails in, in place. So uh, this uh, saved the Luftwaffe for a long time. Turns out that Hay Groves actually designed this in uh, 1921, but uh, couldn't uh, figure out how to use this long steel strut, right? Uh, and the real question is, how did Kuncher get these nails in, right? So you're thinking about this. This is the first fracture tables, right? They just kind of added a table on the back and they would uh, wrap the leg, uh, put the patient on some mattresses. Uh, and you can see here, uh, that they um, use this thing called a, a reduction table where there's a little guy uh, underneath and he would uh, start to manipulate this to be able to move these uh, uh, fragments back and forth to get the, the fracture reduced. And this is wood, right? And it's wood so that you can see through it uh, because you needed to be able to see through it. And how did you see through it with these things? So this is live fluoro. So these guys would wear these live floral masks and put it directly on the patient's leg to try to get a reduction, right? And if you think I'm kidding, right? Uh, this is the picture. As you see this guy trying to reduce a femur fracture, he's got uh, all this, these lead gloves on and everything. But I mean, he's just sitting on the floor with his foot on the pedal, just, just streaming it across his head, right? So unbelievable. So uh, anyway. Uh, when you look at the proximal femur, right, Gross and Kemp wanted to mitigate against this, and they thought that the gamma nail would solve the problems of inotropes already. Now we're in the 80s and 90s, right? Uh, but no, this is nothing new, right, the gamma nail, because Kuncher in 53 had already come up with this uh, Y nail. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is just a variation of a theme. He had thought of everything. And when you look at all the nails now, Right, you can see that these are all just variations of Kuncher's proximal femur nails, which he had come up with in the 50s. We didn't have the, the metallurgy to do it. 
And at the very end of his life, he had a problem with putting rods into comminuted fractures. So he came up with this thing called a detensor nail. In 1968, he had come up with lock nailing for comminuted fractures, okay? But it, it, took, uh, it took a long, long time uh, for any of that uh, to work. And uh, when we started doing it in the 90s, we started using blocking screws. Uh, and uh, this guy, uh, Christian Credick, uh, published this paper on blocking screws, polar screws, which was revolutionary. Those are the, the red dots, right? But it turned out that in 1980, uh, this was already uh, described and it was described by Clement Shellman in 72. Okay, it sounds great, right? But I'm telling you this for a reason because in 1947, an American guy named Dana Street came up with a nail that was square. And the reason it was, well, it was really diamond shaped was so he could put screws around it to lock it in, right? So there's nothing new in orthopedics, right? Uh, so this, uh, this screw, these screws were around it uh, to try to stop rotation. So there are very few original ideas, uh, but occasionally uh, we try to make improvements. And when you're trying to make improvements, uh, innovation occurs, right? So this was a four-year project between uh, Tornetta, myself, Bill Ritchie, and uh, Tony Russell, uh, to how to improve distal targeting. And I show you this because um, when you do distal targeting, uh, you get radiation exposure. Uh, you need a technician and the technician is always out getting a smoke break, you know, at two in the morning when you're trying to put this in. Uh, and then it takes you another uh, uh, 10 minutes to find the guy and it's time consuming. And this, this case here, most people show this, right? They show, you know, nail in, you know, put the screw in the nail. Uh, and they just don't actually tell you what really happens. So I'm going to run through this. This is a not me, but is a very famous traumatologist, okay? This is him putting in this locks, okay? Well, he missed it there. So now he's got to do it again. Now he's got his hand in there, okay? As he finally gets it in, then he's got to do the other lock, right? Then he missed it again with a screw. Okay, he finally gets it in, okay? And there you go, okay? It's over 50 fluoro shots. Over. So when you tell me, you know, you can do this locking, yeah, everybody can do this locking. The question is how long does it take you and how accurate you are, right? So we wrote this paper in 94 about exposure to radiation uh, and clearly the highest uh, average dose of radiation was during distal locking ephemeral fractures. So for 20 years, people attempted to try to do all of this, right? External uh, target arms and uh, none of this worked, right? I won't bore you with it, but none of it worked. So the answer really is electromagnetic tracking, right? Now it's probably robots, but uh, this is a sure shot. Uh, you have a field generator and a sensor in the nail uh, with a wand. Uh, and what you can do is you can do this live time uh, on a virtual uh, computer screen uh, and you can get perfect circles just like you do now, uh, except without fluoroscopy. And when they line up, it works really well. And you can, with this technique, obviously you can see that you can line it up. Uh, and uh, if you're off, uh, you can uh, then just uh, put in the screws and I won't bore you with this, but it's a really a nice technique, not only to put in the drill, but to put in the screws uh, without using any fluoroscopy. So this is faster, very accurate, no technician, no radiation. And I'll tell you that not everybody uses this, but uh, the people in Japan only use this for the distal locks because they're so freaked out about radiation uh, with good reason over there. So where are we today, right? We stand on the shoulders of giants, right? And if you look at this, uh, Lambot and Lane and Sherman, Danis, Kuncher and Mueller, I don't know how many of the residents even heard of these guys, but these are legends. And these are the people that started it all. And everybody else's ideas are probably uh, really just derivative. Now think about it. You got a modern uh, x-ray machine. You got uh, a fluoro. You got anesthesia. You have modern fracture tables. Uh, you have a completely modern implants now. So now 
when you do a routine IM nail or you put in a plate and screws, just think about where we were 100 years ago, 50 years ago, even 30 years ago. Uh, think about where we were then and where we are today. And I would tell all of you that if you want to design, which is necessary, if you have good ideas and you want to contribute, you can't be afraid to be wrong but you can't just imitate. You need to innovate. You need to go to the next step. You need to raise the bar. Don't copy somebody, take their ideas and then add on to it and do something original to make it better for the surgeons, for the patient and for the whole system. Make sure you raise the bar, right? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sanders, incredible. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going to move right along uh, with our, our graduates' uh, research presentations. And thank you. So, uh, Rami, head on up. So, first off, we'll have uh, uh, Dr. Rami Alraba. He came to us from Ramapo um, um, College and went to medical school at Rutgers uh, and was an incredible resident. So, you're off to UCSF for your sports fellowship. And you're going to talk to us today about Achilles tendon. Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, it's uh, good morning, everyone. It's really nice to see everyone here. Um, I mean, I remember starting intern year and being in your shoes and seeing the graduates give their talks. And uh, I really can't believe that uh, we're here. Uh, I'm just proud of these guys and we're all really lucky and blessed to be here. So uh, I'll present this uh, research talk quickly and then uh, I have a bunch of uh, thank you slides for everyone and I wanna thank a lot of people uh, and hopefully I don't choke up, but let's see how this goes. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about a project I did with uh, Dr. Vosser uh, before he left, um, looking at patient perceptions of uh, Achilles tendon rupture treatment. Uh, and I'll talk to as to why that's uh, important. So this is just a basic overview uh, of the talk. Um, and this, uh, I just wanted to show this for, especially for people at home, um, Achilles tendon ruptures, you know, it, it happens when you have this uh, force on your tendon or on your calf area where you have a dorsiflex foot and you have this eccentric load or eccentric contracture. And um, you hear about it all the time on the news, especially with NBA, you know, I'm a huge NBA fan. And this just kind of looking at the players that I've seen in my generation and a lot of players have suffered the, these injuries. And just to kind of show you, this is uh, Kevin Durant during the 2019 uh, NBA finals. You see, as he goes and he dorsiflexes his foot, you're gonna see a pop there. And again, there's uh, a lot of other athletes that were injured in, in the same manner, right here, dorsiflex foot and eccentric contracture. Uh, and this Wesley Matthews in 2015, uh, same idea, I'll move it along here just for the interest of time. You could really see the tendon pop in this one. So yeah, they're, they're graphic injuries. You know, you don't have to be an orthopedic surgeon to know that something mechanical happened over here. Um, so when, when do these injuries happen? Uh, I put up the demographic here, but it's usually males uh, and usually in athletes. Um, in the age range of 30s and 40s. Um, and a lot of people classically, they, they say that these happen in, in weekend warriors. And uh, as you know, my co-residents or I, we're, we're slowly becoming into that demographic. Um, but the treatment is basically surgical or non-surgical. You know, we're orthopedic surgeons. We like anatomy. We wanna restore anatomy. We wanna restore the tendon back to its appropriate tension. But uh, there's always been debate about the optimal treatment for these injuries, uh, especially in the uh, non-athlete. And this debate continues today. Like I said, the goal of treatment is to restore the tension, but we don't want it to heal very elongated because although it may heal, it may be functionally uh, incompetent if it heals in an elongated uh, way. Um, and there, with surgery, we could obviously repair it, excuse me, directly, and uh, we're more confident that we healed it, we're, we're, we're fixing it appropriately. Um, historically, the discussion about treating these Achilles ruptures surgically or non-surgically non centered around the risk of um, re-rupture. 
uh, and issues with wound healing. With surgical treatment, um, historically, it's, it's been said that we have a lower risk of re-rupture, but obviously every time you do surgery anywhere in the body, you have a risk of wound complications. And I'll get into this in my next slide. But with non-surgical treatment, historically, the, the argument's been that um, we increase the risk of re-rupture, but it essentially, if you treat something non-operatively, you eliminate the risk of, of, of wound healing. You're not making an incision. Um, I'll present a study uh, a little later on to show that uh, nowadays this may be changing this notion that increased risk of uh, re-rupture with non-operative treatment just because of uh, early functional uh, rehab. Um, just wanted to show mostly for the viewers at home what wound complications can look like. Wound complications is a, is a blanket term. It could be anything from just, you know, soft tissue cellulitis, a suture abscess, and then you could frank uh, wound dehiscence and necrotic tissue. What's the treatment for this? Obviously, you're going to have to do repeat surgery. So you do a debridement or clean up the tissues. You have to give the patient prolonged antibiotics. And we all know antibiotics are not benign. Some antibiotics could really trash your kidneys, and, and uh, these patients could be on, on these antibiotics for quite some time. And then if you go in there and you take out a lot of tissue, a lot of patients are going to need some sort of reconstructive option, some kind of uh, free tissue transfer or a rotational flap, um, basically showing these pictures to, to show you that, to give you a sense that these wound complications in the distal leg and especially over the Achilles uh, are not benign and uh, they could be uh, pretty terrifying. And you're, it's gonna buy you multiple uh, procedures. So um, with that being said, uh, the data at large still remains conflicted as to which is the optimal treatment for these Achilles ruptures. Um, and because the data is conflicted, so are the treating surgeons. Uh, patients may uh, assume that an Achilles rupture necessitates surgical treatment and surgical fixation, uh, or that surgical fixation is, is somehow better just because that's how professional athletes are, are treated. And, you know, like I showed you, when Kevin Durant tore his uh, Achilles, we weren't discussing non op treatments. When are we fixing this, today or tomorrow? Um, but um, patients may not know that non operative treatment is an acceptable uh, treatment. And not much is known about these patient perceptions regarding uh, their treatment of Achilles ruptures. Uh, so we did this study to kind of um, look, survey patients to see what their perception of the optimal treatment is. And we also sought to evaluate for any uh, correlation or association uh, between their demographic uh, information and their uh, health literacy. Um, this is important because treating surgeons should understand and be aware of, of their perceptions, uh, of patient perceptions and their knowledge and their concerns about their specific injury, uh, because this obviously allows for better communication and better patient satisfaction. Uh, also, if more is known about patient perception, the surgeon can fill in gaps in their knowledge so that the patient and the doctor can both come up with the optimal uh, treatment plan. So how did we do this? We included 50 patients presenting to the senior author's uh, foot and ankle clinic for an Achilles problem, 50 consecutive patients. And we gave them three questionnaires, uh, a demographic uh, form that basically looked at age, gender, race, uh, level of education, uh, marital status, income, and comorbidities. Uh, the second questionnaire is this LIMP survey, which stands for Literacy in Musculoskeletal Problems. It's a uh, validated tool composed of nine questions that evaluate um, general uh, orthopedic knowledge and health literacy of a patient. It assesses knowledge of anatomy, uh, familiarity with musculoskeletal conditions, and uh, understanding diagnosis and treatment of these conditions. The maximum score on the LIMP is a nine, one point for each question. And, uh, you know, it's a validated tool, but uh, a study of looking at the LIMP survey and patients presenting to the ER found an average score of about 4.7. So just keep that in mind. That we, we found that to be the case in, in our patient population as well. Uh, and lastly, we gave them a proprietary survey on treatment methods for Achilles tendon ruptures. And this was a pretty detailed survey. It was, it was 20 questions and obviously asked them what they think the optimal treatment is, uh, as long as some other uh, relevant questions. And then lastly, we looked at uh, associations between uh, the questions. Just for the interest of time, I'm gonna skip through this. This is just basically the, um, 
uh, demographic uh, questionnaire and the health literacy form. And this was our um, Achilles tendon rupture survey that we kind of modeled after similar studies to this that people have done in patient perceptions about ACL surgery or uh, meniscus uh, surgery. So um, our results, the, for the demographics of our patients, you know, the average age was 43 years old and that was kind of, you know, the average or the age group that you would expect uh, an Achilles rupture uh, patient to be. Um, they're predominantly male and the majority of them have, have completed some college and beyond. The limb questionnaire, the average score was uh, 5.3. Uh, and like I said, the maximum score is nine. And the prior study has shown average uh, scores in the population to be around 4.7. And this is basically the highlight uh, of the study. 70% uh, and majority of patients answered that surgery is the most appropriate um, uh, treatment for Achilles ruptures. So patients seem to believe that surgery is most appropriate uh, regardless of, um, sorry, I skipped through the slide, but basically once we, once we saw that, we also uh, tried to see if there's any association between the health literacy um, and demographic information of these patients, and there was no association. The only significant association was found between level of education and, and limp scores, which kind of makes sense. So patients seem to believe surgery is most appropriate treatment for these Achilles ruptures, and that was true across the board across all demographics. Um, and this is also shown in, in other studies uh, that I will show, but basically patient perception of the treatment of orthopedic conditions um, and what is actually done in real life, there seems to be some kind of uh, disconnect. Um, so uh, this top study, for example, they looked at uh, patients presenting to a sports clinic with uh, ACL injuries and about half of them thought that uh, repair was the most common and most appropriate treatment as opposed to a reconstruction. Uh, same thing on the bottom uh, study, patients presenting to a uh, sports clinic were, were asked about uh, meniscal injuries and the majority of them believed that repair is the most common procedure performed. So the disconnect uh, seems to be getting bigger uh, because in the last 10 to 15 years, the uh, popularity uh, of, like I said, the, um, the early functional rehab for non-operative treatment of Achilles ruptures uh, have made surgeons and providers kind of tend towards treating these non-operatively with pretty good uh, results. Like I said, the re-rupture risk is about the same as, um, as, uh, as with surgery. Um, and uh, for example, a nationwide uh, registry study in Sweden uh, showed that 43% of Achilles ruptures in adults were treated operatively in the year 2001. Uh, and this had declined to 25% by 2012 even though the uh, overall incidence of Achilles ruptures had increased in their populations. So the number of ruptures occurring is going up, but we are treating less of them with surgery. But patients still believe that surgery is the most uh, optimal treatment. Um, so th that's all I have for, for uh, the research um, uh, segment of the uh, talk. Um, I'm just going to quickly thank um, a few people here. Um, you know, even though I may never do uh, spine surgery or do very uh, a very peasy case, um, every one of the attendings here had some kind of impact on me, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of us uh, for our education and our training. Uh, you guys really molded us into the surgeons and doctors that we're going to become. So obviously I don't have the time to thank every single person on this slide individually. I just know that you've all played a major role um, in, my, uh, in my career and you've all taught me uh, a great deal. Obviously I have to put the uh, sports surgeons and shoulder elbow surgeons on this slide and, and thank them uh, specifically. Uh, I owe my career uh, to these attendings here. 
Uh, and I'll try not to spend too much time on the slide to be sensitive to everyone's time. Uh, but I do want to um, uh, point out a few things. Um, when I met with uh, Dr. Levine for the last uh, meeting last week, um, and we were kind of reflecting back at the five years and, you know, how did we get here? Uh, coming into residency, I really wanted to do trauma. Uh, that's a lot of what I saw as a student. You know, they let you put some screws in and, you know, it's, it's a visual. It's, I, I loved it. And the experience that we get here with sports and shoulder uh, is, is second to none. And uh, this is really a testament to your leadership and the rest of the faculty. We basically grew to love it. And it's no surprise that three of us are, are going into sports. Um, so really thank you for your mentorship and, and uh, for your leadership. Um, Dr. Ahmad is uh, special to me because he mentored me a ton in research uh, I decided to go into sports pretty late uh, as a third year, and I remember uh, emailing him towards the end of my third year on, on a Friday, and I remember this because Dr. Ahmad operates uh, on Fridays. You know, it was an average day. He's probably doing like 22 cases across four hospitals, but, um, you know, I email him, and uh, I know he has a busy day, and within 10 minutes, he must have been in between cases. He emailed me back, and before I know it, I had 10 projects and 20 uh, video ideas. So um, uh, I, I really appreciate uh, you, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, Dr. Jobin, um, you've been a great mentor to me and uh, you've been a great mentor to a lot of the residents. Uh, you have great hands. You're very talented in the OR. You're a very gifted surgeon and you really know how to make surgery fun and easy. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I, I, you're, you're so friendly, you're so approachable, you make surgery fun. Uh, I, you know, I can't thank you enough for the past five years. Uh, some of my favorite memories in the OR have been your cases. I remember you timing me out as an intern on cases you probably shouldn't be timing me out for, <laughs> but uh, you give us a lot of autonomy and you teach us a ton. And uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate you for that. Um, Dr. Popkin, another uh, true mentor. Um, you were one of the most caring attendings. Uh, and even though uh, I tried to convert you to listen to uh, some upbeat house or dance music in the OR, I think it's wrong if I do an ACL and I don't hear Bob Marley in the background. So uh, you've left a huge impact on me. Um, you're really patient with us. Uh, I owe all my you know, knee scoping abilities to you. Uh, you give us a lot of time. You really make our hands better. Uh, I appreciate you for that. And uh, on a more personal note, one story I could share about him is uh, when it was coming time to rank fellowship uh, lists, I was really conflicted. And I remember you reached out to me and I was down in uh, shock trauma. And uh, we talked on the phone for at least an hour and we went program by program and you told me, you know, I can call this guy at this program, you know, you're honest with me, I don't know anybody here, but I can call here. So I really, really appreciate you. And uh, the rest of the faculty on this slide, Dr. Redler, Dr. Lynch, Dr. Kovacevic, and even the young Dr. David Trofa, um, you've all been uh, instrumental in me and my co-residents uh, education. Uh, and I can't thank you uh, enough. Um, Again, there's so many people I want to thank. I just wanted to single out just a few. And I know um, everybody's had an impact on me. Uh, but I want to say just a quick few words about each one of these attendings. Uh, Dr. Kadiala, I don't know if he's watching at home. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, for those who are watching at home and you know aren't in medicine, this guy has an MD, a PhD, prolific researcher. And he's done about 15 fellowships. Uh, he can do basically any case under the sun, um, you know, joint replacement, arthroscopy, hand surgery, microvascular surgery, uh, and trauma. And, and he taught us a ton. I have very fond memories of uh, being at the Allen uh, with Dr. Kadiala. And uh, it, it's a shame that the younger residents won't work with him as much. Uh, but he was a, a true gem and a true mentor here. Uh, we all appreciate it and we all thank you. 
Uh, Dr. Geller, I, I don't think he's here. I hope he's watching at home. What I want to say about Dr. Geller is that I have never met a patient who doesn't love Dr. Geller. It could be, you know, disastrous outcome, whatever. They love Dr. Geller. Um, Dr. Geller has this sort of uh, charisma about him, which I, I want to be like Dr. Geller. He knows how to talk to patients. Not only is he a gifted surgeon, he's got great hands, but um, he's a true, truly good doctor. Um, he knows how to talk to patients. He knows how to make them comfortable before surgery. Uh, I, you know, and my, my journey coming here really started with Dr. Geller. When I rotated here as a, as a student, uh, Dr. Geller was the program director and I rotated uh, on his service uh, on joint replacement. And, um, you know, and thinking back of why I like this place so much, he was a big reason, uh, you know, he made me feel comfortable and, uh, uh, you know, I appreciate his mentorship. Um, Dr. Rosenwasser, what can I uh, say about you? You are a true legend. Um, you've taught me a ton, very versatile surgeon, you, great hands, you teach us a ton. Uh, I'll always remember about you, we're, we're COVID brothers. Uh, on the first week of your rotation, I got COVID. And then by the last week we were getting vaccinated together. Uh, we got pretty ill after the vaccine and we kept checking on each other for a week. So that was fun. We got Moderna though, you all got Pfizer. I don't know what happened, but um, Dr. Greisberg, I just wanna point you out and say, you uh, are very committed to us. You're always there in trauma rounds. You lead conferences all the time. Uh, and uh, you know, I really uh, appreciate your dedication to us. Even though every time I called you as a one or a two, you kept asking, uh, Rami, I don't know any Ramis. And, and then I keep reintroducing myself. And then, uh, then you would say, all right, well, give the phone to your senior resident. Uh, you, you would still do that to me now, but um, I'm gonna move this along just to, uh, uh, for the sake of time, the residents, you guys, the interns just starting, you guys are really welcome. And this is an amazing experience, cherish it, because really this is, this is why we're here. This is why we all love this place. And, you know, when we talk about a family, um, you guys are gonna make great bonds here. Um, I'm gonna look back at my time here and, and I don't know, I'm just, th there are no words. It's really sad that we're leaving, uh, but the memories that I made with each and every one of you, I will cherish. Obviously my co-residents, uh, I'll be seeing them for the rest of my life, but it's gonna be so hard to get all 30 of us here in one room ever again. So I'm really, really gonna miss all, all you guys. Uh, for my class, um, I couldn't have pictured a better group of people to, to do residency with. We're gonna be lifelong friends and I'm proud of every single one of you. You're all gonna be insanely successful and I can't wait to see what's gonna happen with everyone's career. Uh, yesterday was pretty emotional when we went out to dinner and we were all you know, hugging and, uh, um, but this is not goodbye. Uh, just want to also thank, uh, Amanda, you know, uh, I've met her, uh, within the past year, but she's quickly grown to be my companion. Uh, she's taught me how to travel. Uh, she's, uh, I can always count on her to put the, my mask over my nose when we're in public places. <laughs> and, uh, she also taught me that, uh, Lululemon is not just a fancy fruit. It's a place people shop. So go figure. I'm really excited for the future uh, with Amanda. This is, uh, next slide here is, uh, this is my cousin, Nabil. I call him the dude. He, um, he is really like a brother to me. I hope he's watching. I hope he figured out how to work this Zoom. But um, he, ha he came over here from Syria after the war and he was a very successful <laughs> dentist there. And you know he's had some really unfortunate turn of events uh, but he is honestly, even though with all the misfortunes that's happened in his life, he is the most generous and uh, most loving person. And uh, this is uh, my mom and dad, uh, George and Lena, and my sisters, Sandra and Yara. Um, I honestly owe everything to my parents. They uh, gave up their lives in Syria and came here when I was 10 uh, for a better life for me and my sisters. And I hope I could finally provide for them uh, very soon. And uh, I mean, everything 
that I will become anything that I am is because of them. Uh, they made crazy sacrifices for me and my sisters. And future steps, uh, lighten it up a bit here. Um, I'm headed to UCSF <laughs> with this knucklehead. Um, figures, I, I, I don't know. I think, I think we tend to uh, take our shirts off and flex when we have about half a beer. Um, so I'm really looking forward to move across the country with you, buddy. And uh, we're gonna have a great time. And just, just thank you. I can't wait to see all of you tonight and celebrate and keep this party going. So uh, hopefully all you guys choke up like I did. That was, uh... I wanna introduce uh, Carl, Dr. Carl Herndon. Uh, came to us uh, from Northwestern College and then University of Florida Medical School. Somehow he got to match here and um, he's headed to uh, Ortho Carolina for a uh, uh, hip and knee fellowship. And today you're gonna to talk to us about hip and knee surgery. Good morning, everyone. Thanks uh, for being here and uh, listening to all of us talk. I'll try not to take an hour. Um, so I'm going to uh, briefly, uh, like all of us, I'll briefly talk about my uh, graduation research presentation and then go into a few thank yous. Um, so risk factors of periprosthetic femur fracture uh, and the influence. And it's a lot of words. For those of you at home, uh, sometimes when you do a hip replacement, the femur breaks. The femur is the thigh bone. I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible because I know my dad is listening. Sorry, dad. Um, and so total hip is a very famous operation. It's very well done. It's very common, but there are complications. And so uh, femur fractures account for as many as 6% of all revisions of total hips. Um, and one year mortality after these injuries is anywhere from 13 to 80, 18%, excuse me, um, and so, you know, it's a big injury that requires oftentimes a big surgery to fix. And uh, if you look at the demographic data, the growing number of total hips that will be performed in the U.S. in the next few years, uh, these will only become more common. So knowing how to fix these and more importantly, knowing how to prevent them is something that we should definitely focus on as arthroplasty surgeons. So just briefly, my experience with total hips at Columbia, when I started as an intern, everything was all posterior. Um, and then we had uh, the notable arrival of Dr. Cooper in January of 2017. He came with this fancy new thing called the direct anterior approach on a regular table, supine. I was there on his first OR day in Milstein. It was quite a sight to see. Um, so then other people started uh, thinking about switching for, to more anterior things. So my first and second years, Dr. Geller and Shaw were both uh, transitioning to enter lateral, uh, but in a lateral position more and more expanding their indications. Then Dr. Taka came when I was a third year, another DA trained surgeon. He introduced us to the HANA table. By fourth year, when I came back from my joints rotations, Dr. Geller and Shaw were all anterior lateral, now sometimes supine. Um, and then Dr. Newworth came, he uh, does his hips very similar to how Dr. Cooper does it. And then now by my fifth year, all of our hips are all done anterior or some variation of anterior, all supine all the time. Um, and so we like to call ourselves the anterior hip center of New York. So the, the approach of the hips that are included in this paper are all from, oh, the uh, image doesn't show up here. Anyway, um, are from the anterior lateral approach. Anyway, it's a, a approach uh, based uh, just lateral to the, uh, the traditional huter interval um, that goes lateral to the TFL. That's what that picture was supposed to show. Uh, we could spend an entire lecture about proposed advantages of different dis and disadvantages of various uh, approaches to the total hip. So I'm not going to go into all the literature, but these are what most people think of as the proposed advantages for an anterior lateral approach is that there's easy exposure to the femur, less LFCN injury. Uh, it's the same as sort of muscle sparing effect as the DEA um, and less risk of dislocation compared to a posterior. So there's been a lot of literature looking at uh, periprosthetic femur fracture in the DA approach. Multiple papers look at it, um, describe it on table, off table, et cetera, but not anything had been done for the anterior lateral approach. So our goals for this paper were to identify the patient and procedural factors associated with acute fracture within 90 days and determine if there was any effect of stem design on fracture risk. So it was a retrospective cohort of about 700 patients. Uh, we looked at all their patient variables. We calculated the door ratio. I'll explain what that is on the next slide. Um, we looked at their fracture mechanisms and then used standard statistical analyses. Those are the demographics. Door ratio, this was uh, originally described by uh, Dr. Larry Dorr, who unfortunately passed away this past year, um, back in the 90s, um, that uh, the, uh, anyway, so it's a measure of how much bone there is in the femur. Um, and so the smaller the ratio, there's a large calcar isthmus relative to the daphyseal canal. So it sort of looks like a funnel, like in the picture there to the right. 
And a larger ratio indicates that you have a wider canal, basically more brittle bone, again, from my dad at home, um, more brittle bone that looks like a stove pipe. So that, that's a sort of an image of a stove pipe. Think of a big wide open cylinder that's sort of brittle and doesn't have a, a thick wall. Um, so we used a, a various, various number of implants. I'm gonna come back to this slide at the end. Um, so we uh, split our uh, cohorts up into um, intraoperative and, uh, and postoperative fractures. So I'll talk about the intraoperative fractures first. So like I said, about 700 patients, 57 of these fractures occurred intraoperatively. Um, all of them were fixed at the time of surgery with something like this implant here. You can see the small cable here um, that are, that's uh, holding that fracture together. Postoperatively, most of these people had had uh, slip and falls, um, and uh, but notably, again, a, a, a 14 of these had to be revised. Um, so that's what a, a Vancouver B2 looks like. So that's a, a loose stem that's subsided and fractured around the stem, and so that requires a big revision surgery. So the patient factors that were associated with this are nothing that's going to be surprising to anyone here in this room. Female sex door ratio being higher, meaning that they have more brittle bone. Age in our uh, sample size, we didn't have a large enough sample size for this to reach statistical significance, but all the rest of the literature out there shows that advanced age is likely a risk factor for a periprosthetic fracture. And then stem type. So we split our stems out of these 700 patients. We split them up into um, cemented and collared stems, and then uh, a second cohort of uncemented uh, and tapered wedge stems. And all 57 fractures occurred in the uh, collarless uh, press fit uh, wedge stems. Um, and so, and there were zero fractures in the uh, in the group having cemented stems. So think about that. We're talking about the the stem sort of on the on the on the top of this image here. That were that were the problem children in this in this uh, study. So quick review of the literature again. No, not surprising to anyone. Female sex, uh, cementless implants associated with higher fracture risk, advanced age with higher fracture risk, higher fracture risk in females, uh, higher fracture risk in door C femurs. So again, the stovepipe femurs. Implant uh, studies, there's a, there's a lot of uh, things out there looking at uh, that cemented stems do infer less fracture risk. Uh, collared stems can help with rotational control and some of the hoop stresses, so that makes sense as well. Limitations of this paper, obviously it's a ret retrospective study, so it's uh, subject to the confounders and unrecognized bias that all retrospective studies have. Grouping these various stems into two groups is probably a little bit of an oversimplif um, oversimplification, but it, I think arguably it's useful in sort of real world decision making when you're deciding on um, which implants to use and things like that. Um, underpowered to make a definitive conclusion about age, but we were definitely high enough powered for everything else. So in conclusion, the anterior lateral approach was in this uh, data set was shown to have a similar risk of periprosthetic fracture as other approaches, including the DA. Uh, patient factors that increase risk are female sex, high door ratio, and advanced age. And using stems that are uncemented or tapered wedge stems uh, infer a higher risk than compared to colored or cemented stems. And so when you're considering doing surgery for especially uh, at-risk patients, considering using collars and cement is something that we should um, we would uh, advocate for. And so again, going back, this is the, the uh, implant list on this um, on this paper, and you can see that that top one there, the Actus was there were only seven in over seven about 700 um, of these, and that's now been become one of sort of our mainstay stems here. Um, anyway, we could go on and on, but I think the based on this paper, um, we, if we you know we always talk about what is what does research actually do? What you know how are you actually driving the field forward? And I think at least here in our institution, this, by doing this paper, we were we were able to see that um, using uh, different technology and um, especially for at-risk patients is important. And so um, anyway, thank you to uh, all of my mentors that helped me on that project. Um, Dr. Geller, Dr. Cooper, Dr. Shaw were the uh, three attendings on that paper. And um, yeah, so those are the references from that study. So I'll now briefly, uh, hopefully more brief than Rami, uh, thank everybody. So just starting with the, the faculty at large, we're all gonna say this, but each of you has um, really uh, impacted me as a surgeon, as a person, as a physician. Um, in my time here, I could tell an individual story about every single one of you. Um, so thank you for all that you do and for being academic surgeons and for uh, uh, investing in, in us and in our class. To our residency leadership, Dr. Lynch, who's uh, actually graduating with us today um, and moving on, uh, Dr. Jobin and Dr. Levine, your leadership, especially in this past year, has been um, really wonderful and um, uh, in a challenging time that's been um, 
tough to lead through as, uh, as surgeons and as educators and everything else. I, uh, I, uh, anyway, I, I hope to emulate your leadership in the future. And as um, Alex takes over for, uh, for Dr. Lynch, you know, best of luck. And I know you're going to do a great job. You guys are in great hands. So the hip and knee division. Oh, all the rest of these. Oh man, some of these photos aren't popping up. Anyway, the hip and knee, all these others are supposed to have doppelgangers on them. Um, but anyway, I want to thank that. He was, so he's supposed to be Homer Simpson and then Dr. Cooper, Dr. Shaw, Alex, you were supposed to be Fozzie Bear. Anyway, and then uh, um, anyway, all, all six of you have, uh, have been uh, incredible mentors to me through uh, my years as a junior resident learning what I was going to do and then ultimately deciding to do joints and uh, getting to match my first choice for fellowship. Um, I've learned vast amounts from all six of you and I, I can't thank you enough and I feel very prepared to go to fellowship uh, with all that you've taught me. To our co-residents, you guys are, are, like Rami said, I remember sitting here as a brand new intern and being a little intimidated, but um, you guys are exactly where you, where you need to be. And um, uh, you guys have made work, coming to work every day fun and uh, teaching you as a senior resident fun and learning from some of the seniors. This was the last time we had an in-person graduation, but um, learning from uh, those people there has, has, been, uh, has been really uh, influential. To my class, um, you know, I, I, I know we don't have any women in our class, but I would argue we still have one of the most diverse classes in NYOH history. We have two guys that are off the boat, immigrants that immigrated here uh, as children with their families, two guys that are first generation Americans, and then uh, one of the most underrepresented groups in, arthro in uh, orthopedics is African Americans. And so to be the um, to be the tall token white guy from the Midwest in that class <laughs> was, a, was an honor, was an honor. <laughs> and um, this is, uh, sorry. This is all of Everett's uncles meeting him uh, last weekend. He was born in the middle of the pandemic. And so we, uh, he didn't get to see very many people. And um, Rami couldn't be there because he was sunning himself on the beach. But um, I, think, I think that picture is a really good view of what the world is supposed to look like. And um, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm really grateful to, have a, to be able to have a little boy that gets to see all these, all these model men. Nana, you were a great co-chief. I'm going to try to wrap this up. Um, and. Uh, Again, we had a we had a tough year, but we we've uh, we managed to get through it and uh, didn't uh, <clears throat> didn't fight about stuff. You were always uh, there to help. You were always there to jump in, even when you weren't the person on call for the week. And um, anyway, again, meeting Everett there was awesome. I, I just want to tell one brief story. I'll tell it quickly. Um, so COVID nineteen, like I said, Everett was born in the middle of the pandemic last year. So um, we uh, everything got shut down and. Uh, this was the state of, of New York City. Um, it's, uh, the governor had said that no, uh, and all the hospitals had said that uh, no people could be in the hospital even for, for the delivery. That's what Jenna looked like at the time. Um, and uh, so we were, we were thinking that I probably wasn't gonna be there. But anyway, fortunately I, I was, Dr. Uh, Governor Cuomo made a uh, executive order that allowed me to be there, but these were the text messages and I could have filled this entire slide, but of people reaching out, of people offering to take shifts for me, of people telling me that there was no way I was gonna go to the ER for a, a redeployment because of my pregnant wife and my new baby. And these guys at the time, you know, they were, they were putting themselves on the, at risk, putting themselves on the line. And, um, all these people I, I want to thank uh, individually. I, and I, I got text messages from so many people, but these are the ones that fit on the slide. But ultimately, I was able to, to be there for, um, for, uh, for my wife and for Everett when he was uh, delivered. I had to leave as soon as this picture was taken. And he, uh, they stayed in the hospital two nights after that. But ultimately, we finally got to get him home and, and introduce him to some version of family and whatever else. He uh, had still never met my parents, though. And so he grew up a little bit, finally learned how to smile. And then uh, we did a, a massive, like um, both sides of my family uh, quarantined for two weeks. And uh, we did a road trip because no one could fly so that uh, he could meet my, that's my brother and sister-in-law and uh, my nephew. They have another one now too. 
Um, and so as COVID kept going, fall turned to winter, turned to spring, and uh, now uh, we're looking on the other side of it. So I just, I, I wanna thank my family. This is my uh, medical school graduation. My mom hooded me. She graduated from the same medical school as me, 30 years ahead of me. Um, and uh, actually, this is my first scientific presentation to my mom since I was in seventh grade when I presented my science fair. So, um, so uh, anyway, my, my parents have supported me through lots of different twists and turns, lots of different career choices, lots of different paths, and um, they've been always super supportive in, uh, in raising both of us and uh, now with uh, uh, three grandkids. Um, my in-laws who opened me with welcome, uh, welcomed me with open arms um, when Jan and I got married six years ago um, and have been absolutely instrumental in our, uh, our time here. Jan grew up on Long Island, so they're close. Um, and uh, so that's been a, a great time. And then finally, my, my beautiful wife who can't be here today, sorry. Um, from meeting in college as kids to getting engaged to getting married, I've moved her, we got married right at the beginning of my fourth year, um, and so she moved to Florida, and then we moved to New York, and we've gone traveling, and we've gone to events, and she got her master's from Columbia, and now seeing her as a mom has been just one of the absolute joys and pleasures, and I, I, married, a, I married up, and I'm so grateful for, um, for everything that, that she has given me, and um, everything that she continues to support me in, and, and uh, as we move to North Carolina, I can't wait for what the next year brings. Um, but family comes in all shapes and sizes. And um, faith is a, a big uh, part of my life. And in the New Testament, it says, every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father who does not change like shifting shadows. And I, I can tell you that this group of five men that I have gotten so close with and I'm now brothers with um, are one of, those, one of those gifts. And this is what my work family looks like. These are my best friends for the rest of my life. I'm so honored to uh, be a member of this uh, fraternity. And um, anyway, I can't wait to see where, uh, where the world takes us all and uh, look forward to being best friends with you guys for the rest of my life. So thanks. Everyone. I'm going to welcome up Dr. Ajay Padaki. Uh, Ajay came to us from Penn State University. He then graduated Columbia PS Medical School. Uh, incredible job here as a resident. And uh, he's headed to UCSF as well with Rami uh, for a sports medicine fellowship and a lot of uh, biceps flexing. I'm going to need some ice in my veins to follow that and not get emotional. Um, I wish I rehearsed this more. I didn't realize. <laughs> how scripted this was going to be and how many martinis we'd have with Dr. Sanders last night, which I'm still feeling the after effects of. But I'm just going to jump right in. And we'll see how this goes. So I will present on an instrument that I made with Dr. Ahmad and Dr. Popkin a few years ago called the Youth Throwing Score as the background for that almost 100,000 pediatric baseball players present to the emergency room every year in the United States. And a lot of these players then funnel into sports medicine clinics. Um, some epidemiological surgery or studies here have shown that almost half of young baseball players experience shoulder and elbow pain in the course of the season. And again, almost half of these players engage in single sports specialization, which is um, when an athlete plays a single sport for more than nine months in a, in a given year. And some of the early research that I did here looked into youth specialization, and we found that in the New York population, over half of these athletes would play a single sport um, for more than nine months. And these athletes were significantly more likely to be injured. Um, also, in some other studies that we did, a high proportion of these athletes were influenced by both their parents and their coaches to not play other sports. And it's unfortunate because we found that these uh, pediatric patients were more likely to have injuries and more likely to have surgery. So patient-related outcome measures are obviously a huge part of patient assessment, both in orthopedic surgery and throughout medicine. But in young players, there is no patient-related outcome measure to utilize. Uh, the only validated measure is the Curl and Job Orthop uh, Orthopedic Clinic score, which 
has questions involving scholarships and relationships with coaches and agents, which are obviously not germane to 12 year olds. So therefore we set out to create and validate an instrument in, uh, in young athletes. So we created the youth throwing score and we divided players into three tiers, baseball players who were playing without pain, those who were playing with pain and those who were unable to play due to pain. Um, it's interesting making an instrument for children. We had to make the flush Kincaid level at a level of four, which nine-year-olds can comprehend. And obviously you have to use a vernacular, very unfamiliar to how most of us converse with each other at this point. So we administered this to um, 240 young athletes after we had an interdisciplinary team, including physical therapists, coaches, uh, patients, and orthopedic surgeons to create this outcomes measure. And we did, we then conducted a robust psychometric analysis um, to validate our instrument. So this it was the final product. We had demographic principles in addition to assessing pain, enjoyment, and function in young athletes with succinct questions. And uh, we administered it to these 240 athletes. We found that over 40% had an injury, had a history of an arm injury. And an analysis of variance demonstrated that those players who were playing without pain had a significantly higher score than those who were playing uh, with pain, which provided our construct validity to our patient related outcome. So in terms of our psychometric analysis, we had excellent test retest reliability. So it's having players take the same survey a few weeks apart to ensure that nothing has changed in that time. An exploratory factor analysis showed that um, we had pain, fatigue, performance, and enjoyment as our four domains. And we followed these young players for five months and demonstrated responsiveness that the injured players were able to score higher after the recovery, which is obviously a very important point of um, patient related outcomes. And to provide content validity, you need to have less than 30% of a floor and ceiling effect. And we're at, at about one to 3% of each of those. We then correlated the score with existing outcomes measures, including the DASH and Curl and Job score, which showed moderate consistency. Um, and we found that uh, we had the highest correlation with uh, pediatric outcomes measure, um, specifically for global function and pain. So we created this instrument. It's the first and only validated instrument in young baseball players. We have an extremely robust psychometric validation with um, exceptional reliability, responsiveness, and consistency. And it's now been assumed as the gold standard internationally for young throwing studies. And has already been cited in uh, 20 year national studies. So the legacy of the study and the specialization uh, research that I conducted with Dr. Ahmad and Dr. Popkin and Dr. Lynch is that we presented it twice AOS, twice AOS SM. It's been published in AJSM and JBJS and it was covered in the New York Times with uh, a lot of awesome quotes from Dr. Popkin. Yeah. If you see. I'll now move into the part where I'll try and harness the ice in my veins. Uh, thank you to Dr. Sanders for coming to our graduation and showing us the, uh, the BDE that you possess. <laughs> um, Thank you to all the attendings here. Um, I wouldn't be here without you. For both the attendings in sports and outside of sports, everyone has contributed to my surgical training here. And you know, I wanted, I know that every attending has a different role in the department, but uh, I think the attendings that stay here to operate late to teach us how to operate and train are the ones that I feel especially grateful to. So to Dr. Tyler, Dr. Rosenwasser, Dr. Cooper, Dr. Keller, Dr. Jobin, and Dr. Popkin, um, you inspire us by your teaching and your dedication. Um, and I'm so grateful to have trained under you. To the sports faculty, I think it was a foregone conclusion when I maxed here out of med school that I was gonna go into sports. 
but you made sure that that was never a difficult decision. Thank you for all of your contributions and your dedicated teaching. To our program leadership, I know that it cannot be fun to have kids at home and send weekly emails about logging cases and logging duty hours, but I appreciate your dedication in keeping this uh, top 10 elite residency um, and it would not be here without you guys. Um, Dr. Jobin and I've had a very special relationship over the past few years. When I was a sub I here in 2015, he had to make a bachelor party and left me to close a total shoulder replacement <laughs> with the hardware still there. Yeah. Um, there is, this is a true story. Uh, there, first, this is a, uh, this was, uh, I had to call a PGY-5 into the room to, to help me and just put a wet lap over at the incision because I had no idea what I was doing. Um, that then evolved to you timing me out in cases as a chief on your service, which was by far my favorite rotation of residency uh, with you and Dr. Lynch. And I know that you'll miss me so much that you cut a lock of my hair in the OR on my last case. So I hope that keeps with you, that keeps you uh, good luck moving forward. To Dr. Ahmad, you're the reason I went into orthopedic surgery. I was considering going into neurosurgery. And after I met with Dr. Levine, as a medical student here, he said, you're a chemical engineer. I know a guy that might like your help. So I did some research with Dr. Ahmad and decided to go into orthopedic surgery to stay here and to go into sports medicine. Um, you have so much swagger. You're such an exceptional surgeon. You'd have me over to your apartment when I was a medical student and I was so awed by your charisma and uh, your commitment to mastery and excellence. And I'm forever grateful for your mentorship now and moving forward. To Dr. Levine, he's such a dedicated leader that in his days of seeing 60 patients on Mondays, he would make time to come up to our match day to celebrate with me and Asani back in 2015, and then go back down to West 51st Street and see another 40 patients without eating or drinking anything other than Diet Cokes or Diet Dr. Peppers. I'm so grateful for your leadership and your mentorship, and you're a huge part of why I'm here today. To go into the residents, just wanted to throw in two memes that I thought were particularly relevant. <laughs> I think you come in to an orthopedic surgery residency feeling very uh, benign and innocent, and you leave in a very different place. <laughs> you have uh, some special anesthesiologists that need seven people to put spinals in that uh, contribute to you being very frustrated by the time you leave but it's a, it's a special place. I'm grateful to have done it. As you're putting your first coaptation splints on and long like casts without anyone there to help you. Uh, I think that meme on the right always reminds me that if, if no one knows what you're doing, you're not doing it wrong. <laughs> to the residents, you're the, the blood of this institution. Um, I feel so grateful to have trained with those of you above and below me. Thank you to everyone who's let me prank them over the past few years. There's a lot of emails that go out to attendings that are not, front, not sent from those residents, but that's what happens when you leave your email open and I'm around. Um, I especially enjoy the, the hairy men that I put silk tape all around and seeing how painful that process of extricating yourself is. <laughs> to the residents above me, thank you for showing me the right way to conduct yourself professionally and personally. To residents below me, thank you for keeping me young and honest. I will forever remember you guys and I really love you guys. To my class, I think the, that Carl has already, and Rami have already said it, but we're six brothers. I think anyone that spent time around us knows that we're inseparable and that despite spending every day together we wanna to spend the following day and every night together. And we can't wait to, to see each other again. Um, we've gone through this journey of five years of becoming Columbia orthopedic surgeons together. 
And I'm so proud of you guys. And I'm so excited to see you as future chairman. To my brother, uh, can't wait to send more shirtless photos to Dr. Ahmad. <laughs> we sent that photo to him when we were very drunk with the official NOIOH drink of Negronis. And we sent that to Dr. Ahmad and he said, thank you, I'm celebrating my wedding anniversary today. <laughs> we made it extra spicy. <laughs> to my older brother, who's also a physician, he was my hero and my idol growing up. We've literally traveled the world together and I'm so fucking competitive that uh, he had to put up with me for all of those years. Um, we're still competing. We now compete in how many countries we've been to and I still have you at 50 to 40. Um, he went to Johns Hopkins for medical school and I then knew I had to go to a top five medical school. And for my Tiger parents, I just want the, the record to show that Columbia is now ranked higher than Johns Hopkins for the first time. <laughs> so that's for you, bro. To my parents, they've sacrificed everything uh, to come here. They moved here from India with $100. And they raised two elitely trained doctors. Um, they've sacrificed so much, and I'm so grateful to them. I'm grateful to my dad for my hair, to my mom for my jawline. Uh, <laughs> I really love you guys. I, I'm so grateful for you, and I can't wait to finally provide you with some uh, more meaningful shows of appreciation. So I think that anyone that knows us knows that we're brothers. And in this last slide, it's just that uh, my favorite show of all time is Band of Brothers, which is about World War II cohort. And the way that I view us is that we sacrificed five years becoming surgeons here, becoming Ivy League surgeons here. and. I gained five brothers in the process, and I would make that transaction any day of the week. And I love you guys. All right, so we'll have Rami and Carl and Ajay come on up, and we'll have some questions from our visiting professor. I'm not used to the bromance deal. It's pretty intense. Pretty intense last night. It was really good. So uh, I remember much of it, but. Um, uh, I wanted uh, to talk first about uh, the uh, Achilles uh, uh, paper. Uh, and uh, the Achilles paper is uh, pretty interesting. I would make, uh, I have one question, but I have one comment. And that is uh, patients, um, uh, I try to be kind, uh, are morons. They don't understand anything unless they're in medicine. Uh, and uh, if you don't believe that, just think about what's been going on with the vaccine. They just do not understand. They think there's a microchip that's at least in Florida, you think there's a microchip being injected into you. So uh, when uh, they say that they think that surgery is uh, the right thing, uh, it's because they've been directed by surgeons. And right, uh, the people that take care of Achilles tendon ruptures by and large are surgeons. And that's really why they believe that. But the real question for me uh, is not uh, with the uh, re-rupture rates, uh, but the problem with treating non-operatively uh, is that they can get elongation and then they can't get any push off. And so were, did, did any of these patients have any of these problems? Did they complain about this as opposed to uh, thinking about, you know, their wounds or their uh, re-rupture rates or that surgery was right or wrong? Did that come up at all in the questioning? Um, no, uh, no, not really. It was, you know, we basically surveyed uh, 50 infected patients and we didn't really longitudinally follow them to whether they actually had surgery. They, they did come in for an Achilles problem, but we don't know if that's just a true tendinosis or they just have a calf strain or, you know, uh, we didn't follow them to see mm. what ended up happening with them. Um, but I know, uh, Dr. Bosser, the senior author on this paper, uh, when we met with the patients, um, we gave them the survey before they met the provider. And when they did meet the provider, we basically gave them um, uh, an unbiased reading. And we said, you know, if you're young, healthy, athletic, uh, you know, you have prospects of maybe playing college or, or running something you really enjoy, you do it every day, 
some some people uh, are entitled though. You know, they think that they go to the doctor because uh, they're you know they go to a surgeon, they need surgery, and they want the surgery. And if you uh, tell them you don't need to be treated surgically, they get mad at you and they go find somebody else who's going to operate on them because they're entitled. And you know, gosh darn it, they're going to get their surgery. Well, maybe uh, maybe it's the income thing. Yeah. I, I remember seeing one, uh, you know, uh, reverse oral rotational flap or. A coverage over an Achilles wound, and this was, you know, a forty-year-old woman, pretty healthy, um, and you know, now she has a deformed leg, and you know, forget push-ups, right? It's just how to use it, and, and her function is totally debilitated. Uh, so, if you keep that in mind, it goes back to what we were talking about. You know, if it's a uh, five to ten percent new complication risk that you quoted, it happens to you one hundred percent. You know, so. Right. Um, one of the things that has changed again with technology is now we do these uh, PARs, you know, percutaneous uh, Achilles uh, reconstruction. Uh, and uh, with the PARs and the speed bridge on the bottom, um, you have an incision that's about an inch and a half, maybe two inches, uh, and you make that a little medial. They recommend a transverse when I make a vertical one so I can. Uh, you know, lengthen if I need to, which I really never do. Uh, and uh, you can get the tension perfect. Uh, and they start walking after a month. Uh, and uh, you don't really get wound complications because it's such a small incision. So uh, that might change things. The thing that I've seen uh, with Achilles tendon ruptures uh, that are not treated uh, is that they don't have any push off uh, and they're miserable. And you have to go back in and shorten them. And it becomes very complicated to figure out how much to shorten them because you don't want to over shorten them because then they, they can't get their heel down to the ground. Uh, and so in my mind, uh, Will it, uh, the paper you uh, published, you quoted, uh, was actually one of my trauma fellows. The Canadian guys have to do two fellowships. So he did the second fellowship for sports uh, and um, he published that paper. And um, I, uh, I don't buy it at all. I think it doesn't work. Uh, if, you, if you ask me, if you have a complete rupture, uh, you, and you're, you know, maybe if you're 80, you don't need it. But uh, if you're, uh, you know, vital person, uh, and in Florida, everybody plays sports, even the older people, they play pickleball, they do all this crazy stuff. Um, I, I would fix it. And I would fix it with bars. And uh, I, there are really no wound complications with that. So you have to tell them. But if, if you're an occasional surgeon, you probably shouldn't be doing that because there's a high risk. If you make too long an incision, you don't know how to fix it. So that's that's my uh, my uh, comments about your paper. I thought it, it was very good in that uh, it uh, really did, uh, to me, prove the point that, you know, if you're a surgeon, you tell a patient they need surgery, they're going to listen to you. If you tell them they don't need surgery, they're going to go find another surgeon who's going to tell you they need surgery because that's the way it is these days. Um, so thank you very much for that. The, uh, the next paper was uh, uh, the paper with the, um, uh, the, uh, the mini uh, anterior approach. Uh, and uh, uh, that's an interesting paper uh, because it really um, does uh, shift the way. I can't believe you guys don't do any more posterior approaches here. Uh, you can get uh, dislocations with an anterior approach. Uh, the, the biggest complication I understand, I'm, I'm, I don't do uh, joints, uh, is uh, fractures, uh, periprosthetic fractures. And the interesting thing I want to know is uh, your paper said it was compelling uh, that when you had a, uh, uh, a wedge, it caused a, a, a fracture in many cases, just over time, the axial loading. Uh, but that when you had a cemented prosthesis or collared prosthesis, you had no, uh, no failures, really, no, no periprosthetic fractures. So you guys are putting in all cemented prosthesis now. No, not all cemented, but we uh, use the collar. So you use the collar 100% of the time? Probably not quite 100%, but uh, close to. You do. Okay. And so you've got, and, and what is the literature? What, what, what are people in the... Uh, society saying about the wedges are they going away from wedges as well I think a lot of people are, yeah. they are okay well that's uh, pretty interesting to me so uh when do you use uh cemented prostheses now i think that's a uh, ongoing debate we just we had a panel of senior surgeons at office i think a lot of people disagree but i think in our practice it's probably fair that most people are certainly considering cement at 75 or 80 for sure um, and in select cases in, in younger individuals, especially females, especially white females. Okay. 
Okay, and do you, do you think that the uh, this uh, uh, this uh, modified Watson Jones is better than the direct anterior? I sitting here with two of the VA attendants, three of the VA attendants. The I do think that anterior lateral carotid is a little bit uh, easier exposure to the femur, and it's a little easier to to lift it up. But I think there's also really good data that if you for lack of better terms, you know what you're doing and you can do those thermal releases appropriately and correctly um, with or without the use of the table. Um, you can have a great shot down the table with the VA approach and use the table. Good. Okay. Good. And then the final paper is uh, something I know nothing about, uh, which is the youth throwing scores. Uh, and I, I uh, think that it's uh, really interesting uh, because I know about the KJOC, but the KJOC was uh, for uh, adults. Uh, you know, high, older uh, individuals. So uh, I, I was curious because I didn't, I didn't see it in the paper, but I saw in your presentation that it's uh, starting to be accepted now as uh, the score for uh, evaluating uh, these kids uh, and um, that it's been used in 20 uh, publications now where they use the score. So this, this is the mainstream score now. This is what everybody's going to use. Uh, to make a decision about if kids are playing too much or when they when they need to go away I and mean, stop playing, is that the case? I don't think that it's been done to the statistics of student groups to show whether players are at risk. But I think for actual injury assessment, it has been utilized across uh, mm -hmm. the board. For overuse injury, um, and hospitalitis, all the way to so when you have this score and you tell the, the, the parents, look, this kid has an overuse, uh, you need to stop playing. Uh, does the kid actually stop playing? I think it's pretty difficult to make young athletes stop playing. Like it's at least a significant time. Yeah, well, even if they want to stop playing, their parents won't let them. That's the deal in Florida. It's unbelievable. They get they get so hurt that, I mean, it's, it's really bad. I mean, I don't know. We don't have the time to go into it. I'd love to know what the issue is. But thank you, guys. Those are great papers. I think that, All right, we're gonna not take a break. We're gonna move right ahead. Uh, and so <clears throat> the next graduate we're gonna bring up is Dr. Paul Park. Uh, Paul came to us from Dartmouth, then Case Western Medical School. Uh, became an incredible resident here at Columbia. Obviously chose the best profession, which is fine. And is doing a spine fellowship at Columbia next year. So Paul, take it away. The title of my talk this morning is the Posterior Cranial Vertical Line. It's another uh, radiographic measure that we are now using. Uh, and we wanted to look at how that relates to proximal junctional kyphosis following adult spinal deformity surgery. And so uh, it was very fitting that Dr. Sanders, uh, his great talk on innovation, I also just did a brief slide because I, uh, I find this interesting. But um, back in 1911, Dr. Hibbs did the first spinal fusion here at NYOH. And it was a simple procedure. He did a subperiosteal dissection. He took down the spinous process and he laid it over the lamina. And as with anything in orthopedic surgery, it, it didn't fuse. That was the issue in the beginning. And so uh, from there, the innovation grew from trying to increase stability in the spine so that the, the bones could heal. And so um, whether it's for deformity or disease or instability um, of those 24 mobile segments that we had in the spine, um, the, the fusion technique it, it grew in popularity over this past century, essentially. And so Dr. Rizzer in the 50s started casting people after doing the procedure, uh, the uninstrumented fusion. Um, and then Dr. Harrington developed the Harrington rod, which some of you will see uh, in revision cases, which is essentially a straight rod with two hooks in order to help uh, correct deformity and help with fusion. And then after that, uh, a big leap was made when people understood the idea of segmental uh, uh, stability. And so uh, we see here the loopy rods where they actually would pass sublaminar wires uh, under every level and then uh, uh, basically fix that to the rod. Um, from there, Dr. Cattrall and Dubose then went on to uh, incorporate hooks as well, segmental hooks, as well as the pedicle screw, which was developing in, in the 70s and 80s. And the pedicle screw itself, uh, you know, we see it as very commonplace, but it really is an amazing innovation where you're not only getting fixation in the back of the spine, but it passes anteriorly into the body. <clears throat> so from there, now that, we're, now that we're able to fuse these patients, the question becomes, in what position do we fuse these patients? And so um, several decades ago, you will say described the cone of economy, which is a simple but powerful concept in that the human body just wants to keep the head over the pelvis and over the feet. And it'll do all sorts of things to do that. And when you have 24 mobile segments, there are a lot of different places that this can happen and your body can compensate. 
And so in the beginning with Harrington rods, as you saw, they were perfectly straight. And um, most people were focused on the coronal plane correction. Um, but then when you look at patients from the side, um, in the past few decades, the importance of sagittal balance became more and more apparent, especially with rates of revisions and, um, and failures after these fusions where patients were fused essentially flat. And so the current radiographic standard is the SVA, the sagittal vertical axis. It's a line that we see um, on the sagittal x-ray uh, that goes from the midpoint of the C7 body down and you, you measure its distance from the posterior superior corner of the S1 end plate. So basically we're seeing how we're trying to have a radiographic kind of uh, stand-in for uh, the cone of economy. And so, you know, the problem with the SVA or one of the issues with the SVA is that it really only measures the balance from C7 down to S1. And, you know, the, the weight of the skull balancing on top of your spine and then also your lower extremities uh, makes a huge difference. So this is just an example of patient. This is a really good example of one, the, how, why the spine is so interesting is because every little thing you do in the spine affects the rest of the spine inevitably. And so this is a patient who had had a degenerative lumbar disease. You can see they're losing their lower doses and we can look at how they're compensating throughout the rest of their body. So you can see here, they're extending their hips they're bending their knees, their pelvis is retroverting, and they're doing all of this because they continually are falling forward and getting pitched forward. So you can see how the body's compensating in all other places. And this patient already had a cervical thoracic fusion, but you can imagine they're all, they would also increase their cervical lordosis, all trying to keep their head centered over their pelvis. And so we wanted to create a radiographic marker that could take all this into account um, and that can help us visualize how much the patient is compensating. And ultimately, we wanted to correlate it with proximal junctional kyphosis. And so proximal junctional kyphosis is one of the really difficult issues that we face in, in deformity correction. And that, like I was saying, the spine is really adept at, at compensating and adjusting. And when you have 24 segments that can move uh, in relation to each other, that becomes, that's a lot easier. But once you start fusing patients, you now have this solid piece of bone and you only have, let's say 12 or 14 or six segments above that. And the body's trying to compensate, especially if you have them in a difficult position that you fuse them in. Uh, trying to compensate to keep the head over the pelvis. And that can often le lead to proximal junctional kyphosis where essentially patients break down above their fusion construct. And so the question is, how can we uh, understand global sagittal alignment, including the skull all the way down to the lower extremities um, on radiographs, and then to understand how this could correlate with PJK and the post-operative patient. And so the study had two parts. Um, the first is we looked at healthy patients. Uh, you need a target and you need to understand uh, what a normal patient looks like in order to see where our goals are in terms of correction. And so we had 115 healthy volunteer subjects and we uh, drew this line from the back, the posterior most part of the occiput down to the floor. And we saw how it related to the thoracic apex, the sacrum and the feet. We then looked at this line, the posterior cranial vertical line in 72 adult deformity patients. And then we wanted to see and follow them and see how this line relative to where the instrumentation ended, where their fusion construct ended, uh, affected their rates of PJK postoperatively. And so our results briefly, um, in terms of the uh, normal population study, it did correlate with age. So as expected degenerative changes, the patients start to lean forward a little more. And this correlated with all the expected changes we would see in a patient with older age, such as decreasing lumbar lordosis. Of note, it also correlated strongly with the current gold standard of the C7S1 SBA, which we would expect and which affirmed our data. And then uh, of note, the distribution was interesting. Most patients were grade one and grade two, as we would expect, in terms of that they were well balanced and their head was well over their pelvis. And again, a small portion of patients, about 4%, uh, asymptomatic, but did have their head pitched forward slightly and were PCVL grade three, uh, meaning that the line was in front of both their sacrum and their thoracic apex. When we looked at these patients in the post-operative state following a deformity surgery, uh, we did see a strong correlation with PJK at final follow-up. And it's important to note that even though radiographic PJK is seen on the x-ray, that doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's symptomatic, but it's a marker that we use uh, for patients that may need a revision in the future or may have complaints. And so the immediate post-op PCBL grade uh, was strongly correlated with PJK. So what their PCBL was immediately after surgery. And then we also noted that PCBL anterior to instrumentation had an odds ratio of 4.7 times more likely to have radiographic PJK at final follow-up. So this one figure kind of wraps up the whole idea of the PCVL. So this is a patient who had a uh, 53-year-old patient with adult idiopathic scoliosis and a T4 to pelvis was performed. In the first picture, you see the immediate post-op x-ray and you see that the PCVL 
is anterior to the instrumentation and it's also anterior to the feet. And this is often because patients are kind of equilibrating to their new uh, posture following surgery in the immediate post-op x-ray. And so over a few months in figure B, you see that the patient is starting to already compensate. They've, they've started to lean back. Their PCDL is now posterior to their feet where they want to be um, and otherwise looks okay. Several months after that, you can see now that uh, the patient is starting to decompensate proximal to the fusion construct. You can see them start to lean forward. You can see that they're trying to uh, compensate by increasing their cervical lordosis and, uh, and their proximal junctional angle, the angle at the uh, level just proximal, uh, two levels proximal to the fusion is about 50 degrees. And so we consider anything above 10 radiographic PJK. And then, so you can see this patient was then revised, uh, was um, brought up a couple levels to C7, and you can see that their PCDL has now corrected in the post-op image. So in conclusion, um, it's a two, you know, the two parts of the study, the first part that we uh, wanted to look at was what it looked like in the normal uh, population. And so the PCDL was a grade one or two in 96% of volunteers. And we did see that an increasing PCDL grade significantly uh, was associated with uh, age-related changes, which we would expect. The PCDL takes into account cervical alignment. And we saw this also with our local measures of C2, C7, uh, SVA, and as well as um, we were starting to see it in C2, C7 lordosis. But again, we'll need more normal volunteer patients or volunteers. Lastly, the PCBL anterior to instrumentation immediately post up did correlate with increased rates of radiographic PJK. And so this is important in, tense, in terms of follow-up and also just, just being able to monitor patients and see how they're progressing over time. And also using the PCBL post uh, preoperatively can help us even change our preoperative or post-operative -op plan, depending on if they may seem more likely to uh, lead to PJK based on their PCBL grade. And so these are some of the ways we could use the, the PCVL uh, in the future and something that we can continue to look at as we uh, accrue more patients. So that's the research part. Um, the next slide, all right. Uh, this is, um, I was actually really fortunate as a PGY3 to go on an international experience. And for all the upcoming residents, I really, really uh, recommend taking advantage of this amazing opportunity that they have here. Um, I went as a PGY3 uh, to this hospital in Santo Domingo. Uh, with Joe, who was uh, my chief at the time and now attending. Um, and uh, it, it, was, it was a really incredible experience. And, and you know, this is just the basic idea of what the conditions were like. And as you can imagine, it was basic. And um, spine surgery is complicated. And so we had to bring an incredible amount of equipment with us. But it was really just amazing the effort it took to bring all that down with us. And as you can imagine, these patients wait a year, every year to be seen. Um, there's a one day clinic where you see as many patients as you can. And then you indicate the patients that would um, benefit most from surgery over that next week. And so, um, and you can, these are just a few examples, but the pathology uh, down there that really progresses is really striking. And so really complex and difficult cases, but um, uh, a really uh, well-prepared team goes down and, and, and um, operates down there. And, I think the cases were, like I said, the cases were extremely uh, complex. And um, what I took away from this experience was really understanding that um, at the end of the day, it comes down to your technique, it comes down to anatomy. We have a lot of fancy things that we have here that we're very fortunate to have here. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, you really have to know your anatomy and the basics and you can still perform uh, amazing, amazing procedures uh, uh, with a, a solid foundation. So that's something that I'm, you know, I'm gonna take away from this trip. and. Again, if you guys can go on one, I highly uh, recommend it. Um, and then now on to my thank yous. Um, so, you know, was, I was pegged as a spine guide very early on, um, but I am still so thankful to all the attendings because they, like everyone has said, have taught me so much about being a good, uh, not just a good surgeon, but a good leader and a good teacher and how to run a team and how to treat patients and interact with patients. And, um, uh, yeah, I'm indebted to all the attendees here, and uh, it's been it's been an amazing five years. Uh, this is Dr. Rosenwasser and I, uh, my last award. Um, and then for the spine department, Dr. Weidenbaum, uh, always a friendly face in the halls, and and Dr. Weidenbaum was actually one of the first people I ever scrubbed a spine with when I was a sub by six years ago. Um, and um, yeah, it's great to still see Dr. Weidenbaum uh, in the office. And then um, Dr. Vitali and Dr. Roy, I want to say thank you for. Um, all your teaching, uh, especially in junior residency. I mean, the Pete Spine program here is incredible. Um, and 
um, as you go to other, as you interact with residents from other programs, you realize we really are uh, blessed to have this incredible experience as a two and a three and uh, as a four now. And so um, I, I just wanted to thank them for um, all the hard work they've done and, uh, and for all the teaching they do to the, uh, the PEATS team. Um, I wanna take a second on this slide. Um, I, wanna I wanna thank uh, Mark, um, Joe and Dr. Sardar. Um, uh, spine is a very difficult field to teach. It's extremely high stakes and extremely, can be extremely technically demanding. And uh, these guys, um, I spent a lot of time in the OR with these guys. Um, I put together this slide just from my notes from this past year. Uh, this is just a small part of what I've done this year. And I know um, a lot of the residents are probably cringing just looking at this slide, but um, it, this represents hours and hours of work. And um, <laughs> I did plenty with Dr. Jovan as well. I was always there, <laughs> but um, um, this represents hours and hours and hours of work. And um, like they said before, these attendings took the time. They, they stayed late. They gave me a chance. They invested in me. and. They trusted me with their patients. And that is a huge, yeah, that's not lost on me, the gravity of that. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to thank uh, Mark and Joe and Dr. Sardo one more time, just because um, uh, they were there at the start of my spine career. And I'm just, uh, I'm just so grateful to them for taking the time to teach. To Dr. Lanky, uh, Lehman and Dr. Rue, um, you know, I'm humbled and honored to be at this fellowship. Uh, I realized that these are, um, you know, it, it's a privilege and a responsibility to train with the leaders in your field and, and your mentors. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just incredibly excited for next year and, and we're really ready to work hard and learn as much as I can. So thank you. To Dr. Levine, Dr. Joven, and Dr. Lynch, um, you know, we we talk about all the time, but I mean, the, this program starts with the leadership and um, Dr. Levine, leads by example. And I think that's something that all of us can take away and that I will definitely take away. It's hard not to work hard when your chairman is working harder than you at all times. So uh, Dr. Levin really taught me that. And I, I really appreciate that. And people follow you when you are working and you're at the front and that's Dr. Levin. So thank you, Dr. Levin and Dr. Joven and Dr. Lynch. I just wanna thank you guys for um, always being there and always being active and never complacent. I mean, this program gets better every year. And I know at least the six of us are just so excited for the residents coming after us because every year it gets better and, and you have to be active and you have to be involved. And that's Dr. Goldman and Dr. Lynch, so thank you. Um, to my sister, my older sister, um, you always pushed me and uh, encouraged me. And uh, she just graduated her small animal surgery residency this year as well. And after many years of hard work, of blood, sweat, and tears, um, it made me really proud to be able to put up this slide of us operating. Excuse me. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm just so proud of her. And I uh, couldn't have done it without her. So thank you to my sister. And um, Neither of us could have done what we did without my parents who, uh, who gave up everything for us, for uh, all the opportunity they gave us. So, um, yeah, thank you to my parents. They're the hardest working people I know. And um, yeah, give me one more year and uh, I'll take care of you guys. And then to Maxine, um, my girlfriend, we started dating uh, in the depths of PGY2 when it was really dark. <laughs> and she has stayed with me since. Um, and we've done so much together and, and had such amazing memories these past four years. And um, she's always been a rock and just absolutely understanding uh, of my, at times, very painful schedule and, and work life and stress and um, hard days. And so thank you just so much for all the love and support you've given me. <laughs> Now I get to end it on something like thank you to the residents. Uh, you know, really as a family, I love this picture, even though it's old. And because, you know, the best part is we still talk, the six of us still talk to all the, all the uh, residents who have graduated in this picture. And that's really the whole point. It's a family. And we're constantly in, in communication and 
Uh, even though the six of us are leaving, we're not really leaving. You guys can always reach out to us and talk to us, of course. Um, this is uh, this is um, our first picture together uh, now almost exactly five years ago. And it has been such an incredible journey with these five guys, as you've heard time and time again. You know, we were once young and um, starry-eyed interns, as uh, you can see here. Um, and we tore up New York City for a few years there. Um, but you know, time took its toll, and we grew, and we matured, and we learned, and um, and yeah, we just grew together. And like like everyone has said, we're a family, and so we truly embraced the work hard, uh, play hard mentality. Um, these were some of the funnest five years of my life, and there's no one else I would have rather done it with. And um, though it's hard to believe that they let us operate after looking at this slide, they did for five years. <laughs> And um, I'm just so incredibly proud of the surgeons these five guys have become. Um, I, they, these are some of the hardest working, most loyal, trustworthy, ambitious, talented guys you'll meet. And um, I think this slide says a lot because almost every picture is two of us scrub together. Um, that means coming in on days off. That means staying late to just scrub with each other. And, uh, you know, the, the six of us were always our, each other's biggest supporters, but also biggest critics. And so I encourage you guys to, um, you know, for the residents to always keep each other accountable. And that's what the, that's what the six of us did. And, and I think we're all better for it and we're all better serving for it. So uh, with that, love you guys. And uh, thank you, everybody. Right, well, welcome to the stage, uh, Dr. Nana Sarpal. Nana came to us from Van Dyke University and then Tufts for medical school. Uh, he was a, a stellar resident. Uh, he was headed off to HSS for a fifth and new fellowship. So I'm gonna take it away. All right, we've given my talk on um, the prospective randomized control trial uh, that we did here. I wanna thank my co-authors for all their help in this project, uh, which is um, titled Freehand is equivalent to center guided soft tissue balancing and clinical and patient reported outcomes um, for total knee replacements. Um, by way of disclosures, these are listed on the Academy website, none of which are relevant to this talk today. And so we all know that, you know, total knee replacements are among the most commonly um, performed elective um, surgical procedures in the United States. And uh, we also know that the volume is projected to increase to close to 1 million cases annually in the next decade or so. We know that modern total knee replacements have an excellent track record and patients are now outliving their implants. Um, given the evolution in surgical technique and instrumentation and functional outcomes are primarily dependent on patient characteristics, some of which we can control and surgical performance, i.e. Um, surgical technique and implant design. Success however, is measured by patients, uh, meeting patients' expectations and it's important that surgeons and patients um, are able to align on these expectations. And ultimately this affects satisfaction. Unfortunately, about one in five patients who undergo first time knee replacements are dissatisfied with their outcome. And the reasons for this dissatisfaction revolve around pain, lack of improvement in knee function, and again, patient expectations. So knee arthritis is a disease of bone surfaces as well as um, soft tissues about the knee. And so when performing uh, a successful total knee replacement, we, re we really need to remember the long standing principles taught to us by uh, the late Dr. John Insall, one of the forefathers of um, knee arthroplasty. This starts off with bony resection, component alignment, component fixation, and ultimately soft tissue balance. Over the last couple of decades, it's been an evolution in instrumentation for total knee replacements, ranging from free hand jigs, patient specific instrumentation, and robotics. Most of these are centered around uh, the bony resection. But, but what about the soft tissues, which is um, equally important in restoring joint line and knee alignment? There are many surgeons out there who believe that um, total knee replacement is actually a soft tissue operation and each knee has its own um, soft tissue personality and identity. And you really need to understand how you know, soft tissues influence um, the knee. It's traditionally been experience dependent. It's been subjective and traditionally been uh, more of an art than a science. There's now increasing awareness that soft tissue uh, balance, soft tissue line balance uh, results in about a third of um, uh, early uh, total knee um, arthroplasty revisions in the United States. 
And um, there's literature to support that if you um, balance the knee properly, um, you can get better results in the long term. And so our study aimed to compare clinical outcomes when soft tissue balancing and total knee replacements was performed freehand versus using a sensor guided uh, balancing device. Uh, the device is a, um, it's called the Orthosense of Varisense, which is a technology um, that's disposable. It has a wireless tubule insert, which essentially mimics a polyethylene uh, insert. And it's utilized during a trial and then after impl implantation of components uh, to quantify pressures in um, the medial and lateral compartments of the knee. Uh, and the goal is to achieve less than 15 uh, pounds of uh, pressure differential, which has been proven in um, biomechanical studies to be um, to lead to a stable knee. Um, so we conducted a literature review uh, before embarking on this randomized control trial, which you know had some early uh, previous studies had early promising results, um, but unfortunately these were uh, small and low quality studies. Um, Actually, one study came out of our institution, which demonstrated uh, lower, mates, uh, lower rates of um, knee stiffness uh, when the sensor device was used. And so we designed a prospective single blinded randomized controlled trial here at Columbia, um, 130 patients, um, basically randomized into two groups, uh, freehand versus using a sensor uh, by three fellowship trained uh, joint placement surgeons uh, between December, 2017 and 2018. Uh, our primary outcome was knee range of motion and patient reported outcome at um, different time points of three months, one year, and two years. Uh, secondary outcomes are highlighted here as well. Uh, no clinically different, clinically significant differences in our pace, uh, baseline patient um, demographics. We also did not observe any significant differences in the knee range of motion at any of the time points. Likewise, we did not observe any significant differences in patient reported outcomes. So the SF12, the Womax scores, and the Knee Society functional scores. For the Knee Society functional scores, even though at three months, uh, we observed a statistically significant outcome in favor of the freehand group, this did not meet the uh, minimal clinical important difference, which is 34 points. And so as for the secondary outcomes, we had noted significantly uh, increased operating time on average 23 minutes longer when the sensor device was used. Otherwise, no difference at all in pain scores, length of stay, discharge disposition, complication or reoperation rates. So in summary, we demonstrated that in this randomized control trial, manual soft tissue balancing is equivalent to sensor guided soft tissue balancing at both short and midterm follow-up periods. Of course, the study is not without limitations. Um, first, there was no standardization, standardization at all um, among the three surgeons. But on the other hand, on the flip side, this allows for um, external validity. The other limitation is, um, which isn't unique to this study, is that um, when using this device, we're obviously um, assessing the knee at static points at 10 degrees, 45 degrees, and at 90 degrees. I think future studies should really focus on um, knee assessment during a dynamic uh, knee range of motion. We're grateful and honored to be have uh, been able to present this at our various meetings and won a few awards um, along the way. So just a few words of gratitude uh, from here on out. Thank you, uh, Dr. Roy Sanders. Welcome back to New York City. Um, first, thank you goes to you. We know it's not easy, you know, having a busy clinical and academic practice. Uh, thanks for an awesome time at dinner last night, showing us um, really giving us some good life lessons that we otherwise wouldn't have learned in residency. Second, thank you goes to the best faculty on the planet um, as a whole. Um, thank you for your time and dedication um, to residency education. The reason why we're the best residency in the country is because of all of you. So thank you. Uh, thank you to the Peds Ortho Division um, for welcoming me with open arms as a uh, fourth year student back in July 2015. Dr. Russo was a fellow finishing up at that time. Um, and Dr. Um, sorry, Jen Crotty was a nurse practitioner on the inpatient side at that time. Uh, to the LE attendings, Dr. Skeller, Cooper, Shah, Taka, Newworth, and Hickernell. And uh, Dr. Cardial, who I scrubbed a ton of hemis and even a few primary knees with early on. Um, and Dr. Tyler, who I did a tons of hemis, proximal, distal femur, and total femur replacement with. Thank you kindly from the bottom of my heart for uh, taking extra time to teach me, um, even if it meant you know, going home um, late to see your family. 
it's not lost on me at all. Thank you for giving me the perfect dosage of teaching and autonomy and giving me um, confidence in my journey to become a joint surgeon. Um, each of you have fantastic, unique personalities, areas of expertise, and wisdom to share that I will take with me forever. Thank you to my adult trauma uh, mentors, Dr. Rosenwasser, Dr. Greisberg, uh, Dr. Cadiala, Dr. Strouch, and everyone else here that helped me hone my skills in bread and butter with Peter trauma, something that I hope to continue in my practice. Uh, thank you to Jewel, Denise, um, and Tamika for you know, being the mother hens of the department and for always you know, keeping us in check. Thank you to Carmen um, for keeping the ship afloat in VC3. To the best core residents on the planet, what a heavy and violent year it's been for us. But you all persevered. Thanks for banding together with us. Thanks for your friendship and for honoring me to be um, the chief resident for you this year. You are this residency. You're all invaluable. Big thanks to the program leadership during my time here. I'm um, sorry I wrote up with Dr. Geller back in 2015. You helped select six of us um, that are graduating today. Uh, thanks for always putting residents first and for advocating for us. The man who needs an introduction. Behind every great um, program is a great leader, and we're lucky here at NYUH to have Dr. Levine. Thank you for always pushing the envelope for the department. I wanted to say thank you for being incredibly dedicated to mentorship and advocacy and for pushing me beyond what I could achieve. I took a trip down memory lane in my email inbox. This is just a small but impactful example of his mentorship and dedication to you know, training education. <laughs> there is nobody in academic medicine who is dedicated to trainee education than Dr. Levine. Yeah, take a look at the timestamps. Lunacy. <laughs> You've been a mentor, friend, and father to me. I look forward to your continued mentorship over the years. To my five brothers I gained in 2016, thank you for being you and for your friendship, camaraderie, and brotherhood over these last five years. This is where we started, first year of residency. Some of us had more hair than others, and this is us now. We've always lived by the work hard, play hard mantra. I'm incredibly honored to have been able to scrub cases with each and every one of you guys in the last few months of residency. We're proud of ourselves for what we valued, what we accomplished and for being privileged um, to go on now and represent NYOH when we go out in the world. It's so my co-chief Carl, thanks for being excellent this past year. The amount of time behind the scenes um, might've gone unnoticed, but I know how much work you put in. I think we work perfectly together. We respect the program so much and try to uphold a strong reputation as a leader. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you to my incredibly beautiful and loving family. My mom, Gladys, Annette, Stefan, um, my brother-in-law, Marcus, my half siblings who live in London, who I know are watching right now. Thank you for always believing in me and for your unwavering uh, love and support over the years. I'll forever be indebted to you all. You guys are the real heroes. I love you all. And I'd be remiss if I did not thank my better half and fiance, Emily. As Levisky put it so perfectly, um, so bluntly the other day, Emily is so perfect. She's a perfect baby and child, at least when she wanted to be. Thank you for being a tremendous partner for your unconditional love, your loyal companionship during this grind. I love you and can't wait to see what our future holds.
And finally, I wanted to toast to the ones that we lost on along the way, my dad and Emily's mom, both uh, resting peacefully in heaven. With that, thank you. I love you all. Next up, we welcome Dr. Asani Swindell. Asani came to us uh, from the University of Pittsburgh, uh, then was at a PNS Columbia student with uh, Ajay. Uh, and he has secured his uh, sports medicine fellowship at Rush. So congratulations, Asani. So, you know, you've heard all of my uh, classmates you know, present their projects. It's actually just amazing to say that uh, we're here today because uh, this has definitely been an interesting journey, an interesting trek. Um, so I'm going to you know, pretty quickly talk about a uh, research project I did over the past five years, and then we'll get into our thank yous. And uh, I know people are getting a little hungry for lunch, so uh, we'll be able to get to that hopefully sometime soon. Um, the title of my project is Analysis of Sports Specialization in Division I Collegiate Athletics. Uh, I've been blessed to uh, be able to do this, this project with uh, a good portion of the uh, sports medicine department, uh, who are my co-authors uh, here for this study. Um, with every study, you have to have a problem. Um, so the problem we wanted to investigate, over the past 20 or so years, there's been a, definitely a shift in youth sports um, as we have more and more children and more and more adolescents uh, going from the old days where you kind of participate in a variety of sports over the course of the year to now honing down and being a lot more specific and, and only focusing on one sport for the remain, for majority of their time. Uh, as orthopedic surgeons, we're kind of on the front lines of this issue um, because it just means there's more and more adolescents presenting to our office with overuse injuries. Um, and it's just kind of being tasked with how to figure out how to best deal with these things and get these kids healed up and um, back home with their lives. Um, on the pediatric side, even they're taking a little bit. American Academy of Pediatrics has, all, has issued a variety of different statements over the past years. Uh, recommending against the uh, concept of sports specialization, and even giving recommendations on um, specific times off from, from play um, on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis, uh, and even ways to kind of bring up the subject of sports specialization between coaches, parents, um, and physicians and athletic trainers. And so, you know, the problem we're looking at is early sports specialization. Um, sounds like a pretty easy term. However, I guarantee most of you can't say it five times fast without stumbling. Other issue is there's many definitions to it. A lot of it's based off of in some, some texts, the volume of training that you do, but probably one of the most commonly utilized definitions is a child under the age of 12 years old that has participated in a single sport for more than eight months out of the year, um, excluding any participation in any other sports. And you say, what might be some of the origins of early sports specialization? And oftentimes it's this, this, this feeling by parents, by coaches that uh, the earlier you get your kid involved in the sport, and I think we have Malcolm Gladwell's uh, commentary on uh, the notion of 10,000 hours uh, needed to, you know, become an expert in a specific field uh, to thank for a lot of that. However, we have a lot of data coming out that suggests there's many negative effects to early sports specialization, um, negative effects on muscular scale development at the adolescent level. Um, and then more, it's coming more, more uh, problematic is the increasing psychological stress it has on these children, the exhaustion, burnout, and the increased propensity for injury going forward. Um, but overall, I think the question still remains, is this specialization even needed um, to reach a level of elite level of competition? Um, so to, that's a little bit of a difficult, more difficult question to answer. But what we want to look at is what were the drivers uh, that led uh, athletic participants already at a somewhat elite level um, to specialize. So that leads to our purpose. We want to characterize and investigate which factors contribute to sports specialization in young athletes. We specifically focus this around division one in athletics. And this, we had a two-pronged approach. First was to identify which motivations uh, were commonly used for sports specialization in these athletes at the division one level, and also determine when they decided to specialize and what effects it had on their subsequent athletic participation. The way in which we approached this study, uh, using a Likert scale, um, we surveyed uh, two uh, Division I collegiate uh, institutions, um, including both team as well as individual sports. 
And when our survey instrument, we wanted to pick up very specific details, obviously demographic data, but when looking at the influences for sports specialization, we wanted to see specifically what parental factors, what psychosocial factors, any external pressures that may be at play, and what was the effect of different aspirations for their career, whether it be at the collegiate level or um, at the professional level, and how that had an effect. What we were able to find, um, we ultimately looked at 19 sports, um, 325 athletes were originally enrolled, and we got a 92.4% response rate, which if you think it, college kids getting into response to a survey, I think that's pretty good. Mean age was about 20 years of age, and the greatest proportion of athletes came from the sports of track and field, football, and swimming and diving. And we asked, um, did at any point um, during your career prior to getting to college, did you specialize? 92.4% of athletes did say they specialized. However, like that early definition that I already mentioned about age less than 12 and participating in a single sport for eight months out of the year, only a fifth of them uh, reported that they, they specialized at such an early age. Staying on the subject of sports specialization, um, between team sports and individual sports, um, indiv those participating in individual sports on average specialize at an early age, and this was statistically significant. And then looking at the individual sports, what we found was uh, tennis, swimming and diving and fencing um, all had the lowest age at which athletes reported specialization, and they had, had the highest percentage of athletes that specialized under the age of 12. Across team sports, though, average age of specialization around the age of 17, so most of them played multiple sports before the age of 17, um, and no athletes actually, uh, just saying the sports at the collegiate level reported they specialized prior to the age of 12. The crux of the study looking at motivations for specialization, um, which across both individual as well as team sports, it found that personal interest, skill level, or how good you were at your individual sport, um, time constraints, and an aspiration for future college scholarships were the major drivers uh, leading to specialize. And to look at that a little bit further in comparisons between individual and team sports, what we found is that lack of uh, time for multiple sports, the desire for obtaining a college scholarship, and the desire to uh, eventually compete at the professional level uh, were much more important drivers for those participating in individual sports than they were for those at the team sport level. So the main takeaways, main things we were able to conclude for the study is that, uh, we, again, we only found a fifth of these patients, uh, right, these athletes actually uh, reported specialized before the age of 12. So it was relatively uncommon across team sport athletes at division one level. Um, but when it did happen, it was more likely to occur uh, in those at um, participating in individual sports with the major influence or major driver being um, an interest in uh, reaching collegiate as well as the professional level. I specifically chose those pictures as you can probably tell. Go Calvin John. Um, the study is not without limitations. Um, one, uh, the uh, survey instrument that we use uh, was specific just for this study. Um, so it was not widely validated across um, uh, uh, many different domains. Um, although we use two institutions that um, uh, were based in the Northeast, um, had a large catchment area of athletes from all different regions of the country. And although the fact that kind of our age uh, that we reported of specialization is consistent with what's in the literature, there is also a question of uh, how generalizable our data is. Just say if you were to look at people from a college institution on the West Coast or sometimes down South. Um, other things to note, um, just limited by the sports uh, available at the respective institutions, not all sports were analyzed. Um, the biggest one that was probably missing was gymnastics, which has been well publicized in the literature um, as being a uh, uh, kind of a poster child for sports specialization. And the last thing is socioeconomic factors were not analyzed. So we didn't really look at what cost prohibitive factors such as um, the cost of equipment to participate in a single sport, um, whether an athlete was able to afford to play multiple sports throughout the year, uh, we were not able to investigate those things. However, despite that, uh, this current investigation provided a baseline level of knowledge um, on the motivations behind sports specialization for athletes um, at a high level of play. Um, although we are unable to really answer the question on the exact benefits of specialization um, on long-term performance, which would require a little bit more of an in-depth study, uh, looking at outcomes between non-specializers and specializers. Um, this information can be used for to facilitate and foster discussions between younger athletes, parents, uh, coaches, 
um, as to why the surgeon kid wants to specialize and how we can navigate those risks to uh, uh, decrease the chance of burnout. Um, so thank you for listening to that research presentation. Uh, and now here's going to be a little bit of the tougher part. Um, Columbia as a whole, I mean, I've known so many people in this department for the past nine years since med school. Uh, I remember being a first year medical student moving here from uh, Pittsburgh to uh, New York and not knowing a single thing. Uh, I lived two blocks down in Bar Hall and lived in this building right behind us, which I actually never had to enjoy this building we're in because the construction kept me up at night in the lights. Um, but I just remember being a first year medical student, sending, you know, I think I had a slight interest in orthopedics, sending emails to Dr. Levine, who, who you know, responded that uh, Nana wasn't lying about the different timestamps. Uh, emailing Dr. Rose Wasser to shadow in his clinic and, and to ask me things about the hand. And I was like, thank you, but I will never know anything about the hand. Um, but at least he you know, put the effort forward to even email on Dr. Ahmad uh, to shadow. And he responded. Kind of had something to do with the Yankees, which I didn't really know what that meant at that point in time, but now I think I have a little bit of a better understanding. Um, that progressed to my first uh, first summer after medical, uh, after first year and spending time with Dr. Vitale, Dr. Hyman, Dr. Roy, um, and the Pete's research lab for Roco, who uh, really gave me the opportunity to immerse myself in this department. Um, incredibly thankful for the tutelage and the uh, uh, the mentorship they were providing in that and kind of ever since that moment it, it was kind of just clockwork uh, i knew kind of what i wanted to do and i knew that everyone in this department was going to support me in every way shape or form um, uh, this place is is really a family um i mean i don't want to repeat too much of what my co-residents have already said um, but the time you all take out to not only work on us and, and help us on the sidelines or in the operating room or, or, or dealing with consults, but just the conversations about life has been the biggest thing for me for the past year. Um, they, I, I've learned so many experiences and, and met so many people that I think will be my mentors. There's so many people here who are just leaders of the field. I, I really love that picture. Carl took this on the bottom right corner of, you know, kind of people I use like the legends of this department with Dr. Weinenbaum, Dr. Rosenwasser, and Dr. Mercesi. Um, to, you know, my interactions with Dr. Geller, who was, uh, uh, I was on his service when I was a sub I and uh, he uh, saw me at a not great time, but offered me, you know, welcomed me back and kind of get me going through that whole rotation. Uh, Dr. Katiala, who has just, you know, improved my confidence tremendously. He was the first rotation I was on as an intern at the Allen. Who I was scared out of my mind, I'm not gonna lie, uh, just because he can do anything and operate anything. And it just was an awe of that. And uh, the top right photo with Dr. Tyler, uh, which I'm gonna remember this photo forever, because uh, this was actually the last day of residency. And uh, we had a 14 hour case in one room, and six traumas came in. And Dr. Tyler kind of looked at me and was like, we're in, we're in something. I won't say what word she said. Uh, <laughs> she said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, we're going to operate until they won't let us. And she said, let's do that. And it sounds like a joke, but yes, that hospital actually cut us off. We couldn't finish all the cases. But um, Dr. Tyler, when you finally when you came here, Dr. Levine recruited you here. It was just such a um, big thing for me because it was just so great to see somebody who uh, looks like me in orthopedics. And I've just been so blessed to uh, you know, be able to bounce so many questions off of me over this past couple of years. Uh, to NYH leadership, I mean, from top to bottom, Dr. Litch, I really enjoyed the conversations we had, me kind of just picking your brain almost every single day about the little intricacies of hip arthroscopy. And, uh, you know, I remember when you first came to Columbia as a junior attending and seeing your progression over the past couple of years, it's been very educational uh, for me um, as to how I want to run my practice in the future. Um, you're not going too far, you're going to Detroit. Uh, so uh, we'll keep in touch because I have a couple of referrals right from your way. Um, Dr. Jobin, uh, thank you for putting up with us. Let's be honest. Uh, 
we were in your office quite a bit as uh, twos, um, but we made it. Uh, and the way you kind of handled every little problem that came your way with uh, the ultimate level of professionalism and, and was able to talk on a set a very personal level um, to get us through every little problem. I, I really appreciate that um, for pushing awkwardly a lot this year. Um, that was really needed for me. Uh, and I saw tremendous growth. And then Dr. Levine, I don't really know what else to say. Uh, you've been there actually since day one, um, always able to meet at 5 a.m. or 11.30 p.m. on a Saturday night um, when I might have had one or two beers, uh, but I lied and said I didn't. Uh, <laughs> you've been the ultimate mentor, um, the ultimate guy in light, both professionally, personally, emotionally, uh, perfect model of how to do things the right way. Um, between you and Dr. Ahmad, uh, on sports fellowship interviews, it's actually, I won't say who said this, but it came up a couple of times and they were basically like, if you can do 10% of what those two guys do, you probably do all right. Um, and that's just a testament to kind of you know, your reputation across the world, across the country. Um, to the vision of sports medicine, I hope I'm not reaching the same amount of time Rami took, uh, so I'll, I'll hurry up. <laughs> um, again, so influential in everything I'm doing with my career. I'm going into, obviously going into sports and, and I would not be going where I'm going and doing what I'm doing, but not for you. Uh, for Dr. Ahmad, uh, you really changed how I pro surgery. Um, my preparation, um, just striving for excellence and every time you walk into the OR and what can go wrong, how to navigate such a busy schedule. Um, it's just been a pleasure to see. Uh, Dr. Popkin, thank you for making sports fun. Uh, I was so happy when you won Teacher of the Year last year and, and, and I, because I feel like I benefited the most from that, that situation. Um, I talked to you about everything. I talked to you about everything for the whole process of fellowships last year. And uh, I'm still talking to you about everything. And I, I, I love the relationship we were to foster. You were actually my appointed faculty mentor when I first came in. And I can say many faculty members probably kind of weird out, but are stayed strong throughout that entire time. Um, Dr. Rettler, seeing you, you know, first come in and, and you know, take on challenging cases, it's good to see that because uh, I'm going to be doing that very shortly. And you, you know, took everything in stride and, and you succeeded. And uh, Dave, uh, so I was your sub I way back when. And I knew kind of from the get go that we shared a, a certain, how should I say, fiery passion at times. And uh, you know, knowing that you were able to get through this program and do pretty fine, I, I, I really use that as a barometer, you know, how I was able, how I might do in this program. So thank you, buddy. Uh, my fire has dampened a little bit. Uh, I think yours will as well. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you for everything. Uh, to my co-residents, you know, we say this all the time. It sounds very cheesy about how this is a family. You know, you guys are the reason I wake up every morning, come into work, and it makes it worth it, to be honest. Uh, I talk to you and share just about everything with you. You know, there's people who have passed who have taught me uh, everything I know and, and, and taken the time and the effort. And I really just hope that, you know, the past couple of years, I was able to be um, mentoring you the same way those people before me were able to. Um, Josie made a joke at my roast that I am a lingerer. Don't worry, I'm not gonna get you back for that. Um, but the reason why I linger and hang around so much is because I actually like you guys. <laughs> uh, I like spending time with you. I like, you know, I, I'm very excited to see all of your growth over the next couple of years. And uh, I'm not, I mean, I'm not going anywhere. So continue to text me, uh, call me. Uh, AOS is in Chicago next year, so definitely uh, hit me up. I would say drinks are on me, but I know you guys too well. and. Uh, I got a lot of loans to face, so I probably can't do that for a couple of years. Um, I'd be lying to myself if I, if this PowerPoint is not working great. No, okay. Um, I'd be lying if I say, you know, you could do any of this by yourself. Um, so I really just want to take time to thank my entire NYT family. You know, I've been here for nine years. I've met so many people um, throughout the hospital, every scrub tech, every nurse, every circulator got me out of trouble um, from the early days, Nora saying, don't do that. 
And, uh, you know, you being a potentially overconfident intern or second year and you realize, no, Norris was right. Don't ever do that. Uh, <laughs> Um, it just it just goes down the list how appreciative I am to have met you guys and there's really kind of not gonna be anybody like you, I think, going forward for me. Uh to my coaches. Uh you know, guys, we made it. Uh it's crazy um to think about the growth, um, to think about the dog days that we experienced during the second year and you know how we were able to mature over the last couple of years, grow into the surgeons that we are today, grow into the people that we are today, I think more importantly. Um, and uh, you know for the interns here, uh, you have no idea what you're about to experience. <laughs> um, but stay stay very close, stay very true to your class because they are the people that literally the worst days you're going to lean on them for every little thing uh, and they really make it all worth it. Uh, to my family and friends, I say friends because again I've been here for nine years and uh, went through some really tough times, some really dog days and I wouldn't have gotten me through it if uh, I keep using dog days but uh, some really interesting times where I wouldn't have gotten through it without you know friends, without you know, people willing to open up their homes and, you know, if I'm on call or doing something because I uh, wasn't able to get back to Michigan, to my family, you know, just opening their doors, giving me a meal, something like that, um, having a time opportunity just to hang out. Uh, I've just been really appreciative of all that. It really developed a, I don't really have a giant family, but I'm just so glad that I have like a New York extended family. Uh, to my family, um, I have them on FaceTime. I've been having it the whole time. Sorry. Uh, Abari, you are my younger brother, but I look up to you in so many ways. Um, I don't think there's anybody I've ever met that's more mentally strong than you are. Thank you for keeping things together at home when I... Couldn't be there at times. Um, and all I can say is just let's hold on a little bit longer. We're gonna have a lot of fun going forward, okay? Uh, to my mom, uh, you've, we, we've had a very rough couple years. Um, I don't think there's any way in the world I could possibly thank you for everything you've done for me between you know, what you and dad were able to do for me from the early, early get-go and uh, kind of helping me with this dream. That not too many people thought we could have, you know, obtain, but did it. Um, that picture in the middle is when I graduated med school and I said, yeah, I did the accomplishment, but look, this piece of hardware is for you. So, Every degree I go and I you know, attain, every accomplishment, they're they're all yours. So, thank you, mom. I love you. And it's my dad. Um, my coach chief knows the story. Dr. B knows the story. Dr. Geller knows the story. Um, a lot of me ending up at Columbia is directly dependent on my dad. Um, my biggest fan, my biggest mentor, everything I am is because of him. This is his tie, for God's sake. Uh, so the story goes, uh, I was starting my sub I and I was putting together my list of places, one to apply, one to go. And uh, I started off um, with Tropa. Uh, and I would call him all the time, text him about like, you know, how the sub is going, how I'm having you know, a good time. Like the people here seem to kind of get me. I couldn't, I wasn't very good at verbalizing that. I'm not very good at verbalizing things now, but that's a whole nother thing. Uh, and at that time I was sold on leaving New York. I was like, I'm getting out of here. Um, but him, you know, these our conversations every time he's like, look, you're, you're saying you're leaving New York, but you're saying nothing but good things about the place that you're in. And I said, so, and uh, my dad has a good way of always being right. He never rubbed it in my face, but he's randomly always right about everything. He just knew things were gonna turn out a certain way and things were gonna turn out for a good 
you know, in a good way. Um, so that was one of the last conversations I had with my dad. And so it's just so interesting that a year after that, I opened up my letter and this is where I'm going. So to say that Columbia means so much to me, is just an understatement. So, uh, hey, Dad, thanks for being right one last time. This was our first picture at Carmine's. Um, we had no idea what we were doing. We had no idea what we wanted to do in life. Uh, we were just excited to be here, excited to be with one another. And let's be real, we were kids. Um, and to see the growth, the maturity that has happened over the past five years is amazing. Um, between people finding their significant others, starting families, having a new set of brothers that I call for anything. I don't know, I've been so blessed with the entire thing. So thank you guys. And uh, let me stop ugly crying for a moment. <laughs> Just going to go uh, through some uh, quick questions here. Uh, so I'd like to do uh, one question each. So to Dr. Park, I, I looked at this besides the fact that I went, I couldn't believe the amount of uh, instrumentation that went on in these patients. It's like absurd. They have to have more pain after surgery than they did before. But anyway, um, like how, how do you measure their occiput? Like I looked at the x-ray, you know, and, and they stand there like this, but, you know, they could drop their head. They could do this. How do you reproduce where the head is? on the x-ray? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're- lucky That's why I asked it. I mean, we're lucky because we have to get that x-ray to be seen from all the way from the top of the head down to the feet, which really helps us. I think it's the natural progression of why we're able to do this kind of style of measurement. But the patients are instructed to stand in the machine as they would in normal, in real life. So the couple of volunteers were clearly instructed not to lean on it, just to stand in the most comfortable position. And even in African patients with pathology, we instruct them the same way. Some patients have such a pitchfork posture that they can't even, the image can't even be taken because they're half their spine is cut off because they're leaning forward so much. Jesus. Sometimes they use a bar for support. For, That's terrible. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Dr. Uh, Sarban, uh, this, uh, this paper uh, actually says that you don't need robots. Is that correct? <laughs> I think it's it's hard to simulate a place like this in surgery involved in very rare experience. So um, I think it might see a difference if you you know put it in the hands of research and someone trying to break it into yourself, it might see a difference, but you know, this all this research is that at least can be the so you you come from a, a very uh, uh, excellent uh, residency program, and uh, one of the things that is still a lot of people in America don't do fellowships. Uh, they're general orthopedists, they graduate and they go out and what do they do? They do scopes and they do joints, right? And some basic fracture work. So for them, uh, they need uh, all the help they can get to be reproducible. Uh, and uh, I would agree with you that, um, you know, the robots are not necessary and they add more time to the OR, uh, but for somebody who uh, doesn't, feel completely comfortable about gap analysis and managing it, uh, these things really do make a difference. So uh, I, I would agree. I think it's an important uh, study, though, uh, to prove that uh, the, the, the technical capability of the surgeon uh, is still as good or better than the robot, because ultimately we're going to be replaced by robots. And so yeah, if you're really good technically, you're going to be faster and you're going to have a good skill set. So uh, you, you should learn how to do all this stuff without uh, all the additional tools. And then uh, finally, Dr. Swindle, I, I read this paper uh, and it was interesting to me, but I, I, I'm not a sports guy. I didn't know what to do with it. And I had uh, three girls that weren't really uh, interested in sports so much. So I didn't, I wasn't one of these parents on the sidelines. So, uh, but what I gather from this and the other paper is that uh, Probably the parents are crazy and they uh, they force their kids into doing way too much too soon and then they end up getting hurt. So how does this uh, uh, affect that? What can you do with this data to, I guess, talk to families about? 
Um, so I think it's uh, you know the information we're able to kind of cover and cover the investigation in terms of groundwork and framework. So say you have a kid, a baseball player, comes in and you know starts starting out in the top side, you know, moving your belt or moving your shoulder, and the parents are like, hey, what's going on? Is the training wrong? Yes, it might be, but this is where that's the kind of the, the point in which we're going to broach the subject of, hey, how old is your kid? At, at, at 13 years old, and somehow throws his seven miles per hour. Well, that's not right. Um, but how do we scale things back so that one, you know, you have to have a potentially longer career plan uh, and then not also have to go with some of the other kind of psychological things, the psychological stress things, um, you know, the things where the, the, the early sports specialization has negative impact on your grades and access to the later. So, it really gives the uh, position between doctor, the athletic trainer, how that avenue can be better for you to at least start the conversation with the parents. Cool. Okay. Good. Thank you. It's really great to have had Roy be here uh, as a longtime friend of Dr. Rosenwasser's and myself and others in the faculty uh, to be able to share this first in person graduation we missed last year. It was virtual. So uh, we're really uh, thankful to have you here, uh, Dr. Sanders. Is going to take us home. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I do have to say that uh, this is uh, really, uh, I, I have the honor of being a graduation speaker in a lot of different programs. And uh, I don't know about the rest of uh, the uh, uh, residency, but uh, after last night, I finally get the, the deal that they're a family and a romance, a bromance, whatever you want to call it. And uh, it, it means a lot. I like to think that our residency uh, in uh, Tampa is kind of like this, but I go to a lot of places and they don't have that that family. And this really important uh, uh, when uh, when you uh, have to uh, spend five years trying to learn and, and, and absorb all of this. And that honestly is a, is a testament uh, uh, to Dr. Levine's uh, uh, vision of what this uh, program should be uh, and continue in the legacy of uh, Columbia. Uh, and uh, it's it's my, my residency, I can tell you, is uh, uh, nothing like this. We had eight people. I don't even remember the people in my class and we didn't have a graduation and you kind of got a diploma and kick out the door. So this is a whole different a way of being. Uh, I think it's it's really important because these are lifelong friendships that you develop uh, and the skill set and people that mentor you and teach you how to take care of patients and rely uh, on each other uh, throughout the years uh, as a network. So uh, I'm very uh, uh, humbled to be here and uh, really uh, uh, enjoyed uh, last night and today and, and watching all this. So, so congratulations to all you guys. You're gonna do great wherever you go. So uh, I'm gonna um, uh, give you a, a lecture now. Uh, this is a, a serious lecture uh, on uh, tail and neck fractures. And uh, I am a trauma surgeon uh, who uh, kind of focused on a foot and ankle because there was nobody doing this stuff uh, back when I started, and uh, there's still nobody really doing that much of this. But um, when you think about car accidents, mostly, right? Uh, you have uh, airbags and you have um, uh, uh, seat belts, you have everything, uh, but there's nothing to protect the feet. And so these people end up getting fixed, everything gets fixed, and then they're crippled because of their feet. So I'm going to uh, try to uh, explain uh, the management of tail and neck fractures for you now, which are actually uh, pretty uh, significant. So this again, my uh, disclosures. Um, and the goal of this lecture really is to teach you about newer classifications, latest approaches, surgical techniques, complications, and risk counseling. Now, the thing about the uh, talus is that it's uh, about two thirds is covered with cartilage. It has no muscle and no tendon insertion. So that already affects the uh, blood supply uh, to this uh, bone. and uh, the blood supply, as you know, uh, comes from three uh, vessels, the posterior tip, the dorsal pedis, and the uh, perineal. Uh, but most of it, it comes in uh, retrograde, right? So it comes in from distal uh, to proximal. And so when you get a neck fracture, uh, it, it disrupts the blood supply to the dome, which is the, the main portion, right? And so 50% 50, 50 of talus fractures uh, involve the tail or neck. Uh, and why it's the weakest point. And you think about a nutcracker, right? When you get a hyperdorsiflexion, it just cracks it. Uh, it's very porous because that's where the uh, blood supply is. 
And uh, actually the tail and neck is the extra articular component of the, uh, of the fracture, right? Uh, and it really just gets trapped in the joint. Now this was first described, uh, well, it's described a lot, but the first real uh, description of this is by Hawkins. And this was in 1970, so it's not that far away again, right? And he looked at 52 patients and he had about a 60% avascular necrosis rate. And when you look at that and you wonder why, uh, this is from uh, his uh, article, and uh, they treated all these with closed reductions and casting. And this particular picture, uh, he says that uh, seven weeks after group two fracture dislocation, subcondyl atrophy is good. It eliminates the diagnosis of avascular necrosis. So they treated it closed. And if they were able to get the blood supply to go back into the, the dome, uh, they were okay. So this is a Hawkins, uh, Hawkins type, right? A Hawkins classification. Um, the first uh, type is a type one, it's non-displaced. Uh, and uh, these uh, typically can be treated non-operatively. Uh, and so here you see a guy in a national roping competition, right? And you see him roping this uh, cow, or whatever this is, calf, a pretty crazy uh, athletic endeavor. Uh, and uh, he, he advanced to the next uh, stage, uh, but he had injured himself in the first stage. You might not have picked it up, but he can barely walk now, right? I, I don't know how he flipped this calf, but uh, he flipped himself as well. So uh, he uh, had tremendous pain and he came in uh, somewhere else uh, and they diagnosed this as a non-displaced type one fracture, okay? Uh, but is it? So they got an MR scan because he still had pain. They weren't quite sure what was going on. Uh, and here you can see uh, in the MR, the fracture actually goes through the body uh, and uh, it's not really through the neck. And then there's something else going on uh, in the dome, right? Uh, and you see this. So this, this uh, kid would have been treated completely non-operatively uh, had they not gotten this uh, MR scan. And so when I saw the patient, uh, it was about two weeks out and he had a lateral dome fracture uh, and this injury. Uh, and you can see this here. Now I had to take it apart. I tried to keep the dome uh, on one of the fragments so it wouldn't come out. Uh, and we're able to wedge this to loosen it up to turn it into a regular uh, uh, fresh fracture. You can take this and then pin it, put it back together again. Uh, and there you see uh, it pinned. And then what we use is we use these uh, PLLA pins, uh, and these pins uh, uh, can be uh, drilled with a with a, a one six and then a one five pin or a two five and a two four pin, uh, and then you can melt them off with the ophthalmic cautery uh, and then put screws in uh, to fix this. And here you see him three months uh, post injury. Uh, and he has a very nice Hawkins sign with that subchondral atrophy to show uh, that he's got a really good blood supply. And he's gone back uh, to roping. He had a scholarship uh, to college, if you can believe that. Probably the most important part of this lecture uh, is that this paper by Heather Valier, who is now uh, the, uh, the president of the OTA, uh, published this paper on the classification scheme. And these are two very different type two uh, fractures. Before we didn't really understand them when we lump them all together. But if you look at the two A, the subtalar joint is intact. It's just subluxated. So this is, you have to understand this. So it's, it's a non-displaced, it's a two A or a two B and then the threes, which we'll go into, right? What about attempts at close reduction? I heard a couple of stories about close reductions in the ER uh, at Columbia last night when I was uh, intoxicated, but um, uh, I would just tell you the close reductions don't work. Uh, you can pop it in, God bless you, but if you can't, you have to take it to the operating room. Uh, and certainly if you put it back together upside down or inside out, which can happen, uh, you need to correct that in the operating room. So the reductions really must be open and you got to look at the ankle and the subtalar joint. And not only must it be open, it's got to be anatomic. This is really important. So this is a very small a bone with a lot of rotational control, right? It's the acetabulum of the foot. 
and everything swivels around it. And you got two columns, a lateral and a medial column. If you get this wrong, right, you screw up the whole foot, which is kind of crazy because it's just this simple fracture. But uh, this is a paper by San Georgian. And in 1992, he published this and said that even a small offset in the tail and neck translates into two or three times as large in the body of the talus. And what it does is it alters the medial column. Uh, and I'll show you that in a little bit, but, it, but remember that the lateral column is out to length. So if you shift this with rotation, it causes varus of the hind foot and shortening of the medial column, and then the patient is crippled. So you need two incisions. I don't know if anybody's doing one incision anymore, but you should not be doing one incision because you can't see what you're doing. So medial incision, right? Tipomalialis to the first metatarsal and a lateral uh, is an anterior cortex of the fibula to the fourth metatarsal. And you come in, this is a bowler approach laterally. It's hard to kind of see, but um, you can go all the way to the head of the talus here, right? That's a tail and navicular joint anteriorly. Uh, and you can see the fracture. Uh, when you go medially, uh, you put in a medial base screw uh, that's countersunk. Uh, and that, that really uh, is what you need to do. And when you countersink it, I like to use cannulated screws for a specific reason, uh, because you can put the head in backwards. Any screw, just put it in backwards and make sure that the screw head is buried. If it's not buried, then you got to take it out again. And when you put it back again, it will not get the same bite. And then you can lose fixation. You can destroy the cartilage. So if you use a cannulated screw, it's a really nice trick. You just put it right over upside down and then put the screw in when you're ready. And then the other side, the lateral side, you want to put that screw in the lateral lip there. So typically you have enough of the lateral process that you can just put a screw in and they shouldn't be parallel. Uh, you should get the compression of the medial screw and then you add the lateral one to close it. Uh, and this is uh, when you do it, uh, it should kind of look like this and you can look at the stability of this uh, and check it and see that it's stable. Uh, and this is the way it should look. Uh, but the problem is uh, that they came up with this study in 92 about these posterior screws and biomechanically a posterior screw is stronger. Uh, but the problem is uh, that when you do this, uh, there's a very, very tight window to put this screw in and most people don't do this correctly. This is a paper by one of my fellows <clears throat> after they were in private practice uh, and uh, they published this. But this is like, there's no way that you can figure out where the screw is supposed to go. I mean, you're standing on your head, drilling this thing upside down, right? And if you actually look at it, they're in the middle of the dome. They're in the articular surface of the back of the ankle. This is a disaster, right? Uh, and they're also angled in the wrong plane, but I, I won't even get into that. The real interesting thing is this is called a Lemaire screw and it was published in uh, France, right? And ultimately in the Journal of Trauma, this is the original article, right? Look at where this guy's screw is. So this is a subluxated joint now, right? These screws in the wrong place. So please don't do this. Don't ever do this. There is a very small window if you have to do it in the posterior lateral a tubercle, but you'll almost invariably catch the flexor haliosis and then the patient will have catching. And sometimes they get caught in Aquinas and they can't un undo their foot. So I don't, I don't like this uh, screw at all. Uh, and um, there are uh, other ways uh, to treat these fractures. And uh, this uh, is um, an other option for something that's very bad uh, posterior medially you can make a separate posterior medial approach. You have to move the neurovascular bundle out of the way. Uh, but most of the time, most of the time, you can get away with a medial malleolar osteotomy. So if you have a, a fracture that has a, a significant amount of dome comminution, then you're not going to be able to see the reduction. You just can't. So you have to do a medial malleolar osteotomy. And the way this works is you pre-drill it. Uh, and you should put a guide pin in uh, at the corner of the chevron uh, so that you can balance it, right? And if you look at what I've done there is I made one saw cut and then I put the saw blade, a free saw blade in that saw cut. 
so that I know what the angle is because I have to put this, this thing has to be uh, equidistant. It has to be uh, symmetrical to cut. So when you, when you drop it down, actually uh, it's not gonna be off center, off balance because you wanna have a really good visualization of the joint surface, right? And when you do this correctly, uh, then you can kind of see all the way in and now you're able to see the fracture, you're able to fix, you can dislocate uh, or subluxate the joint and get all the way across and be able to put in your, your pins uh, to make this work. Uh, and what happens if you have a comminution? Well, if you have comminution, it requires plates. And this is a paper that only came out as early as 2002. And this is the other problem, right? And I'll show you here. So before that, uh, people would just compress it but it was comminuted, so it was short. So now you had a short a neck. And if you have a short neck, and this is probably a little too much for everybody, but if you think about it, if your medial column is short and your lateral column is long, you're gonna end up with a varus hind foot because the lateral column is too long. It's pushing you into varus and you end up with an Aquinas contracture as well. So this is a guy who was um, kiteboarding uh, and he fell uh, about 100 feet into the bay. Uh, and so this was uh, the side uh, with uh, sand and shells because uh, he fell in about three feet of water when he crashed he didn't fall into the bay. Uh, and this was uh, uh, his uh, a bad side. Uh, and this was his good side. Uh, and so uh, we ended up amputating the other side. Uh, he got infected, we fixed him, but he got infected and his talus was dead and uh, that's a long story. So we needed to make sure this side was right. Uh, and so um, you can see that this is a, a 2B. This is a very bad injury. But uh, if you go in with plates, with two uh, separate incisions, you're able to put this thing back together again Right, and there you can see the medial screw and you can see the lateral plate. Uh, and this is a nice reduction. Uh, and uh, here you see a post-op CAT scan because we always get post-op CAT scans, okay? Uh, and here you see him two years. Uh, he's uh, normal range of motion, no pain here, regular shoes. Uh, and he's obviously got a BK on the other side, but uh, he's very happy. Eventually, he'll need a subtalar fusion, but it'll be a simple, straightforward fusion in situ, and he'll be able to wear shoes and be pretty normal on this side from that. Now the type threes are bad, right? All, uh, all the major arteries are disrupted, and uh, these are high energy injuries, uh, as you see here, uh, and uh, the posterior tibial nerve is sometimes in the way. The problem with these, the most common issue is avascular necrosis. And so one of the things that we were concerned about uh, was with uh, these displaced fractures, the surgical timing effect, the AVN rate, because when we had this as a surgical emergency and they would wake me up and I would come in, whether it was one in the morning or three in the morning or whenever it was on a Sunday, if I'm at a football game, it doesn't matter. I'm coming in to fix this, right? So, but I didn't know if this was really a, a reasonable thing or not to do. So uh, we looked at this, we published this uh, in JBJS in 2004, uh, but uh, we had uh, all isolated injuries and the time to fixation, there were some that were under uh, uh, six hours, they came into Tampa General and the other stuff was referred to us and some of it was referred to as as long as, you know, a week beyond, right? So it's 26 fractures. These were all isolated injuries. So we didn't have any other variables and our ABN rate, was 50%. And we looked at our AVN rate, it turned out that it was related to the Hawkins type. It was not related to the timing of fixation. So the die is cast once they had the injury, okay? You wanna fix it, you wanna make it better, you wanna protect the soft tissues, but you're coming in, you know, within two hours or you're coming in within, you know, two days is not gonna alter the outcome. Uh, this is another thing that people don't quite understand. So this is a Hawkins sign, the subchondral uh, uh, atrophy, right? This means uh, that you're not going to get uh, ABN. But if you get this, and this is a quote dead talus, right, with no Hawkins sign, this doesn't mean uh, that they're going to get ABN. This just means it's going to take them two or three years to revascularize this. So what happens to these people is you fix them 
And in the old days, they say, well, you had to keep, wait to see subchondral atrophy before you walk them. Well, you can't keep a patient on weight bearing for two years. So after about three, four months, they start walking and they're fine. When this thing vascularizes, right, they're gonna collapse because they're walking on it. And when they walk on a collapse, it's always gonna be eccentric, right? It's gonna be to the valgus or varus. And then they're gonna have a deformity. They're gonna have a lot of pain. They're gonna come in. And then what you do is you just put them in a cast and let them calm down that fracture and let it heal and then see how they do. And then you will make a decision whether they need a fusion, whether they need nothing, whether they need a total ankle, but they are all gonna revascularize. It's just gonna take a long time. Okay, so that's that's the misnomer, but you cannot not walk these people after three, four months. They lie to you anyway, they're going to do it. So this is uh, the other problem. Uh, when you do get something like this, you have to avoid the soft tissue, right? Because this thing is wrapped around the neurovascular bundle immediately. It's hanging on the deltoid, right? And it's stuck there and it's going to necrose the skin or damage the neurovascular bundle. Uh, if you don't reduce it. So in this case, in this patient, we did a medial malleolar osteotomy because we couldn't get the fragment unreduced. Uh, and then uh, we fixed this and uh, I don't know how she did. I imagine uh, she did uh, all right uh, on this injury, but this lady uh, was um, uh, really, uh, she, this was a plane crash. Uh, and her husband died, uh, there was a private plane and they ended up going to a trauma center uh, as the very first trauma center patient uh, treated uh, by um, uh, just some general guys uh, and they could not reduce these. So they put her in X fixes and discharged her and told her to go find an orthopedist. Uh, I'm serious, so that's Florida. Uh, so uh, I saw her five weeks later like this uh, and uh, took it to the OR, I was able to reduce the first one uh, and we pinned it uh, and then uh, put screws in, uh, medial uh, and a lateral plate. And I did put a posterior screw in her uh, very carefully. Uh, this is her right side. Uh, you can see uh, the, I shoehorned this in uh, and uh, you can do a, a, what do you call it? A um, Achilles tendon uh, lengthening if you need to. And this was the final on this. And here you see her CAT scans and they look really pretty good. Uh, but uh, it should be uh, no surprise to you that at four months, uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, x-rays you get. And she had pretty bad AVN, but she already uh, had arthritis. Uh, and uh, this was starting to fall apart, right? Post-traumatic arthritis was very painful. Uh, this was her other side, which was equally bad. At least it was in line. And the point about this is that... Um, uh, she had post-traumatic arthritis in both legs, right? But she didn't come back to see me for two years until these things revascularized. And then she started to have significant pain, okay? And so this is, you know, the problem with the Hawkins uh, threes is that the AVN rate is, is 70 to 100%. The post-traumatic arthritis rate is 70 to 100%. And on x-ray, it's 100% period the end. So when you look at this lady, uh, this is what I did for her two years later. We did a, a double hind foot fusion on her uh, on the left. Uh, and we did this on the right. And I try to save her tail and navicular joint. Uh, and this is a fairly significant uh, a procedure on both legs. And you think that uh, this is fairly crippling. But here you see her uh, she sent me this video. She was in a department store in Japan. Now, she's not barefoot. She's not wearing high heels. She's wearing sneakers. Uh, but I don't know if any of you have been to Japan. The department stores are endless. Uh, and she decided to walk the whole thing uh, to show me that she was doing great. So uh, even uh, though uh, they're very uh, stiff, uh, they're painless. And uh, she's very functional in an adjusted shoe. Uh, type fours uh, are not that common, the tail and navicular dislocations, uh, but most of these are with associated Taylor head fractures. And I would tell you that if you get a Taylor head fracture, right, once you fix it, uh, you have to protect it because it's going to shear off. And so when you protect it with a bridge plate, so you go into the navicular, you go uh, distal into the cuneiforms, 
And then when the shear fracture is healed at three or four months, you can go ahead and take the bridge plate off. Uh, and then uh, this is that patient 13 months post-injury. So I'm gonna just run through some salvage cases here. This is, because uh, this is the reality of what you end up treating. So this is a guy uh, who had this injury, a dislocated subtalar joint, crushed ankle, right? And uh, this is his CAT scan. I don't know which is what, and his head is uh, completely sheared. Uh, and this is uh, the uh, sagittal. Uh, but the problem with this guy was he refused surgery uh, when he came in at five weeks and he just wanted uh, to be treated uh, in the most expeditious way. He actually wanted an amputation, but I said, no. So we did a, a talectomy, right? He refused the fusion. So I did a talectomy on this guy and uh, here you see it, I pinned it. I uh, didn't do a Blair fusion, didn't do anything, just did a talectomy based on what they said in Iowa. And he came back at one year to prove me wrong. And here you see him standing on this and he's, he's a boilermaker, right? This is a guy that works uh, as a welder. And uh, six years later, he came back again. Uh, and now this is his x-ray, right? So he completely shortened on it. This is the kind of emotion uh, that he has, none. Uh, and this is the way he walks, right? And, and again, he had pain, he's embarrassed, he's collapsed. And I want to do a fusion with a bone block on the guy. And he said, no, I want an amputation. So we gave him an amputation, right? This is a rare, but normally you would go ahead and fuse this guy. But I can tell you the talectomy is anecdotal. I think it only works in Iowa. It doesn't work anywhere else. And all my three cases failed. So I don't ever do it again. Uh, this is a guy who fell uh, about 10 meters and had this injury. Uh, again, very significant, uh, type two with a dome smashed body. You can see this subtalar dislocations. Uh, and I was doing a calcaneus in one room and my fellow was doing this uh, in another room uh, and he was putting everything back together again with biofix pins uh, and then everything fell apart. So in this case, right, uh, we uh, threw all of this out. We pinned him uh, and then we brought him back another day we put this guy prone, we put in a bone graft through a posterior approach. And uh, so we ended up fusing him uh, and he completely healed. And again, you can see that these guys can walk pretty well uh, five years post injury. Um, this case uh, is a patient that had isolated ABN. And this is what happens if you leave it uh, alone, right? And they start to, uh, reconstitute, then they collapse and fracture. So this is somebody who had a stress fracture, had some pain in the ankle, got AVN, never knew it, no, it's thought they just had a chronic sprain because the other ankle is normal. And they came in because they couldn't take the pain anymore. And when you get an X-ray and you get a CAT scan, this is the way it looks. So um, what you do, then I got an MR and you can see that there's not enough bone here to put a total ankle in this. There's nothing to do, right? So uh, when you look at this, you go in operatively. This is a freer elevator, right? So this thing has no strength to it. And I'm able to just pull all this dead talus out, right? So uh, what we do in a case like this is you take the, the, um, uh, the talus out, you take uh, most of the dome out, uh, and then you uh, put a laminar spreader in to take the rest of it out. Uh, and we've actually written this uh, up multiple times. And then when you have this defect, you take an acetabular reamer and you create a socket. Okay, everybody thinks I'm nuts, but um, basically uh, you use the reamings as bone graft in the back, and then you take a femoral head allograft uh, and you start to fashion it. You have to shave it down to the right size. I think this was a 42 millimeter and it starts to fill in the gap. And here I, I soak it with PRP. I don't know, it's all voodoo, but I use uh, uh, this um, BMP2 uh, infuse, a whole sheet of it to wrap it like a giant taco. Uh, and then you can use the neck of this femoral head allograft uh, to line it up uh, to the neck of the uh, talus. Uh, then you're going to put in uh, a, a nail, you're going to add supplemental fixation. And then I actually, this is kind of crazy, but I actually plated the um, allograft to the live 
little remnant of the, of the Taylor head, uh, and there was an infuse uh, between it. Uh, and here you see the post-op CAT scan, uh, and here you see it at a year, uh, and you see she's completely healed, uh, and she had actually got a fusion between that, uh, those two fragments, right? And what that did is allows me to keep the tail navicular joint open so that she doesn't have a, a pan tail effusion. And this is her seven years post-op uh, wearing just kind of regular shoes. And if you catch her in the back end, you can see, see, see she's a big woman uh, and she's an investment banker in town. So this is, this is all salvageable stuff, right? And then uh, this guy, I have two more cases. This guy uh, fell asleep. He had a tree. He was a lawyer. He was fixed, but his ankle is still subluxated. And this is his other side. Uh, and they threw out, I guess, his uh, head. They didn't know what to do with it, right? He has AVN here. He's dislocated. Uh, and um, this guy, you know, his head is gone. And this is the way he walks. I told him it was going to take me a year to reconstruct them. So he moved from Miami to Tampa. He relocated his entire family so I could uh, take care of him. So the first thing we did was we did an ankle fusion, which allowed him to wait. He had to wait three months until this could walk. He could walk on this. Uh, and then once he could walk on this at about five months when he was ready, we went ahead uh, and did this. So. I'm gonna do uh, something very similar, but I also don't wanna fuse his tail and navicular joint. And so uh, I use a fasciolata allograph, which was first described in 1915 for hip arthritis. This is what they used to do for hip arthritis. They put fasciolata in there, interpositional allograph, right? And in the elbow too. And in the elbow, yes, sir. We, I, I actually did that two months ago. Again, Dr. Frankel like drove me crazy, but I did it anyway. Uh, and uh, what you do is you take this piece and you, you, you sew it up, you make a, a ball out of it or, or some sort of structural uh, uh, arthroplasty here, and then you pack it in. This is a different case, but you pin it and then you wait about six weeks, you pull the pin and by then it's scarred in. So uh, here you see where I did that again for him. And you can see uh, that this looks like it's calcified, uh, but it's not, it actually moves. Uh, and this is uh, him walking now. Uh, and he's, uh, he's a trial lawyer, so he's on his feet all day. He obviously does not walk like this uh, with, uh, without shoes, but uh, he doesn't care, he has no pain. Uh, and then this is the final case. So this is a lady that came to see me with pain. Uh, they, they fixed her talus and the screws are too long and it destroyed her joint and she had some ABN. I carried her for a long time. This is her MRI from 2009, uh, and this is it from 2013. And you can see how the AVN has uh, gone away now, but she was left with a post-traumatic arthritis. Uh, and uh, most of the arthritis uh, is in the dome. The rest of the body is okay. And I actually treated her for a long time with bone marrow aspirate uh, and PRP, uh, but um, this, this at some point she needed a total ankle. So we did a total ankle with a subtail effusion. And unfortunately I did the subtail effusion uh, first. Uh, and as a result, she was in too much varus. Uh, so I actually had to go back and uh, take this screw out and do an osteotomy. Uh, but after that, um, she did uh, really well. Uh, and here she is two years post total ankle. So you can put a total ankle in somebody who has ABN, especially if you use a flat cut talus because you're cutting away all the avascular necrosis. The literature review uh, shows you that um, uh, the results are not good. If you have a type one or a type two A, remember that's just a subluxation of the subtalar joint, they have no AVN. And that's why that's important to know whether they have a two A or two B. But if they have a 2B or a 3, it's about 50% chance. And if you look at it, obviously most of the problem is the type 3s. But a type 2B, you can tell your patients about a quarter of them are going to get AVN. It's going to be a problem. Obviously, the worst outcomes are associated with neck comminution and open fractures. And the functional outcomes actually are pretty awful when you look at the literature, right? Reconstructive surgery, a quarter of the patients within one year. Half of the patients that have a tail and neck fracture need reconstructive surgery within 10 years of their injury. 
That's a really devastating injury, okay? Uh, the outcomes with a meta-analysis do show, uh, and I won't go into this, but what it does show uh, is that fixing them with screws and now with screws and plates have improved the results, although it's not to statistically significant. The osteonecrosis rates are going down probably because we're able to get to these patients uh, sooner and uh, treat them uh, better. So in conclusion, I would tell you that the type 2B changes the prognosis and you need to know this to be able to talk to your patients about this. Uh, the timing is urgent, not emergent. You don't need to go in in the middle of the night, but you probably need to do it the very next morning. Uh, the incisions, don't do one incision because you can't control for rotation. So this is medial and lateral rotations, uh, incisions. Uh, if you have comminution, you absolutely need a lateral plate. Uh, and the ABN rates are high, and they're going to be the highest uh, for the type threes. So just remember, you try your best, uh, but the reality is uh, you should expect the worst. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. And thank you very much for inviting me. I enjoyed my time here. Plus, it's New York, so I love it. Thank you. <laughs> oh. I gotta wear I gotta wear the tie the next time I come in 20 years. Right. If you don't want a combination and you want to get the mic back, like you said, do you have a bone graft piece if there's closed injuries before you put the plate in? Yeah, so it's tough. You can uh, you can get bone graft, but you need structural grafts the way you're gonna get that. So then you need to do it from the hip, right? Because if you just put cancellous bone and it's gonna dissolve or fall out, right? So then very occasionally, if that's the case, uh, you do. You take a iliac press graft, a tricortical graft, and you wedge it in and you try to line it up and then you put the plate on. I can tell you it's very hard to do and it doesn't really work because you have two interfaces to try to get the heel, plus you're trying to get the dome to heal and trying to get vascularity, everything. Uh, it's worth the try. Um, in those cases, actually, I'll just do a subtail effusion and then fuse the neck to the anterior process when I revise it and I bone graft it that way to keep it out to length. But there's, there's no way in my estimation to be able to resolve that. That's not a, it doesn't work. It sounds like it would, it, it doesn't work. Any other questions? I didn't mean to rush anybody. I'm sure everybody wants to go. It's a beautiful day. It's a Saturday. I appreciate it. Any questions from residents? No questions? I have a question about that. There you go, Dan. <laughs> so, uh, you talk a lot about adding something like DMP to the, to the sequelae that that outcome for the trees. Um, and then is there any room for augmenting biology, or, or is that, that just like the injury destroyed everything and then you feel the. Uh, you mean at the, fra at the time of the fresh fracture? Yeah, yeah we, don't, we don't do anything uh, at that time. Uh, I don't know that uh, it makes a difference in a fresh fracture because you're going to get this massive inflammatory response from the injury itself, right? So that should be enough. Uh, but it's the re reconstructive stuff where it's inert, there's no inflammatory process, you're trying to juice it and stimulate the whole thing, then you're going to add anything you possibly can. A lot of it is voodoo, some of it works. Uh, my estimation, my, my reality is that BMP2 works for revisions for fusion. So I use it a lot. I'll, I won't use the big sheet except for something like that, but I'll cut them up and put them everywhere. And it really helps the fusion mass. So I use allograft most of the time uh, and allograft and PRP and, and DMP2 really does make a difference in the union rate of your fusions. So I think you're saying it's too expensive to even try. Well, they tell you it's too expensive, but just talk to the spine surgeons. It's not too expensive for them, is it? And they're doing it up and down, <laughs> up and down. Just... All right. Um, well, for the residents, uh, the, you don't know this. Uh, we actually used to go to Tampa. And uh, right. you can see from Dr. Sanders' passion that he, the reason we went was because of his relationship with Mel. And we were looking for a level one trauma program. It was a little too far for travel, so we ended up uh, changing. But the, he by far was the, the main uh, teacher of the year from our residents every year because of his passion for teaching. And you can see that today. 
Uh, so we have some uh, mementos for you. I didn't really need to do this but Well, you. that's part of your now. Just a trip to New York to spend time with you is enough, huh? So, <laughs> um, so Roy, thanks Thank very you. much for everything oh, and wonderful. enjoy the rest Thank of the you. weekend with your uh, with your wife. I will, man. Thank you thanks, so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you.